much for coming, uh, joining the meeting uh, virtually. Uh, I'm going to call to order the regular meeting of the Board of Administration of the Federated City Employees Retirement System and Healthcare Trust. Uh, we'll start with the roll call. Uh, uh, let's go through uh, Anrag Chandra, Vice Chair. Present. Spencer Horowitz. Present. Julie Jennings. Present. Mark Kelleher. Present. Elaine Orr. Present. Chen Yu Sun. Here. Okay, and um, I'm here, so we have all members present. So thank you very much again. Uh, I'm going to read into the record instructions as provided by council. Thank you very much, um, council, for preparing this for me. Um, we are convening by electronic and telephonic means as permitted by the governor's March executive orders. The board staff and consultants are attending the meeting via Zoom conference and the public, uh, general public has full access to the audio part of the meeting through electronic, I'm sorry, through telephonic means also provided through Zoom. The governor has authorized his method of conducting our public board and committee meetings during the COVID-19 pandemic. To help ensure a smooth meeting and record, we'll be following a few ground rules. One, as required by the Brown Act, all votes will be by roll call. Two, if you are not speaking, kindly place your microphone on mute to cut down on background noise. Three, on matters for discussion, I will call the board members in order and each of you will have a chance to speak and uh, more than once if you wish. Four, uh, please try not to interrupt the speaker if you'll just take notes, you'll have a chance to ask questions and make comments later. And five, the chair will give the public an opportunity to speak on each agendized item and at the beginning of the meeting, uh, and again, at the end of the meeting to speak on any other item not on the agenda that is when the, within the uh, subject jurisdiction of the board. If members of the public will wait to speak until I invite public comment that will keep the process orderly. And a uh, huge thanks to all dedicated, capable staff for getting this technology working for us. Um, and then with that, let's move on to orders of the day. So I have two items regarding in orders of the day. First, uh, I'd like us to uh, agree to wave sunshine on the revised memorandum for our CIO uh, for item 3G, the contribution uh, pre-funding matter as a revised memorandum was posted late. Second, I would like us to take up item 3G at a time certain of 10 o'clock to accommodate the city's finance director's ability to join us for that discussion. Uh, may I have a, a motion and a second to accept orders of the day? So motion. I'll second. The motion made by Trustee Kelleher and a second by, uh, by Vice Chair Chandra. Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So, all in favor? Should be roll call. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, that's I'm going to do a roll call vote on that. Um, Vice Chair Chandra? Uh, aye. Trustee Horowitz? Aye. Trustee Jennings? Aye. Trustee Kelleher? Aye. Trustee Orr? Aye. Trustee Sun? Aye. Okay, that uh, motion carries unanimously with all board members voting in favor of the motion. Um, as we jump into the agenda, uh, I'd like to remind all speakers to clearly state your names for the record and audio recording. Uh, let's proceed with the consent calendar. Uh, are there any items on the consent calendar that need to be pulled? And if not, I'll request a motion and a second to approve all items on the consent calendar. Oh, I'll make a motion, Trustee Chandra. Thank you. Seconded, Trustee Horowitz. Thank you very much. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all, all members in favor? I need to do a roll call? Uh, yes, roll call again. Vice Chair Chandra? Uh, aye. Trustee Horowitz? Aye. Trustee Jennings? Aye. Trustee Kelleher? Aye. Trustee Orr? Aye. Trustee Sun? Aye. Uh, myself also, that motion carries unanimously. 
All right, then we're going to move on to item two, death and survivorship notifications. I'd like to ask for a moment of silence for those who have served the city and who recently passed. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, moving on to item three, investments. 3A is the oral update from the CIO of Retirement Services, Mr. Palami. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have a number of items under investments uh, this morning. And uh, so firstly, after my oral update, uh, Newberger Berman will present third quarter private equity performance reports followed by uh, Mekita of fourth quarter performance reports on, on public markets as well as uh, private debt. And uh, uh, Mekita will also present some revisions to the investment policy statement uh, following the asset allocation shift uh, that we made in March. And finally, we will uh, talk about the city's uh, pre-funding option. So there's a number of items in, under investments Hopefully each one of them won't take uh, too long. Um, now firstly, as, uh, as you may all recall, at a special board meeting on March 27th, uh, the board decided to shift its strategic asset allocation weight uh, to go from about a 60-40 to a 75-25. And uh, the investment team got working on it right away and uh, in the new mix of 75-25, about 49% was public equity. And that was our really our focus was to move as quickly as possible to public equity. And we did that uh, right away. Uh, we started, uh, I believe the board meeting got over at about 12.30. So we had about 30 minutes uh, to trade. And so we got on that right away. We couldn't get through all our trades that day, but uh, the following Monday, we were able to trade as well. So, and as I had mentioned at that meeting, uh, the focus was really uh, on moving quickly to uh, public equity, the new public equity weight. And we still had to give some thought to how we were going to structure fixed income. So in a couple of minutes, uh, Jay Kwan, a senior investment officer for public markets will actually talk about the fixed income restructuring as well as where we are today in terms of our strategic asset allocation weights. Now, what this has also done is that moving to the SAA is not something that can be achieved overnight for some of the other asset classes. For example, we've opted to reduce, in the revised SAA, uh, we've reduced the return to absolute return strategies. And a lot of these strategies have gates, meaning uh, we cannot liquidate those strategies right away. So it will be several quarters before we achieve the new weights. And which is why uh, we had to revise the investment policy statement to reflect that. And Laura Weirich from Makita will talk about that later. So without further ado, uh, actually I do have one more thing. Uh, we do have some preliminary performance numbers uh, from Makita through April 13th. Now, these are estimates, uh, mind you, because uh, while we can actually calculate with reasonable accuracy the performance of public markets, um, we cannot do so for private markets. So we've actually kept the private markets return to zero for that time period. And so for the fiscal year today through April 13th, um, the fund, the plan was down 4.3%. And first quarter 2020, the plan was down 10.6%. Again, bear in mind that these are estimates and Laura will actually talk about uh, this uh, later in her presentation as well. So with that, uh, unless there are any questions, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Jay Kwan. Can I ask a question? This is the trustee, Sam. Yes, please. Um, so you, um, your team has a jump, has a, a resort to allocate to public equity right away. So what is the updated weight on public equity uh, roughly at this time? Uh, it's about 50%. And in fact, uh, Jake Kwan will be talking about that. So the, the 
the strategic asset allocation weight, I believe, was the one that was approved was 49%, and I believe we are at about 50%. Okay, thank you. Sure. And we, I'll turn this over to Jay Kwan, and I will give Barbara uh, a minute to actually pull up the uh, to share screen on the attachment. Good morning. Morning. Hi. <clears throat> All right. I'll I'll uh, I'll begin. If we can turn to the next slide. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's Linda working the machine. Uh, so as, as probably noted, we managed to move to Mixed B fairly quickly and fairly smoothly. Uh, it was a large change um, and implemented very rapidly, which for strategic asset allocation is a, a little unusual but uh, understandable given how volatile markets were. So as, as probably noted, we're largely at target. Uh, so broadly speaking, equities were 49 policy weight uh, target, were at about 50%. Uh, privates were at about 21% target, were, at, were right at about 22%. Um, fixed income is also broadly at target, uh, but there are some over and underweights. Uh, notably in something like absolute return, which again, probably noted is, is going to take some time to unwind. Uh, and so overweights there are offset by underweights in different, uh, different areas of the plan, including slightly in fixed income. And so what I wanted to talk about mainly uh, was the changes that will occur uh, within the different asset classes so uh, specifically within fixed income, because that's where some of the more significant changes uh, are implied by moving to the new policy weight. So uh, again, uh, broadly at target, uh, at, at the level of equities overall, or fixed income overall, or even private markets overall, but within those different asset classes, um, you know, whether it's regionally within equities or within things like uh, uh, high yield or long-term government bonds within fixed income, there are uh, underweights uh, to remedy. And so that's the work that uh, everybody is focusing on going forward. Um, and the, the slides that we're going to walk through address how we'll approach some of the changes in fixed income. So, um, we can move to the next slide. Uh, so as, as you see in the middle of the page, uh, under the old allocation, we held most of the fixed income exposure in short duration. So the bonds that mature between one to three years from now. Uh, and this was generally, this was a, a risk and liquidity offset to a higher alternatives allocation. Um, and uh, we had also prioritized remaining liquid enough to uh, have that allocation serve as a funding source for an eventual risk on rotation. And of course, that's the last month was exactly that scenario. And for the most part, things went according to plan. So uh, now the focus will change from providing liquidity for a rotation into equities to it'll, it should become now uh, partly a, a risk offset to an increased equity allocation. Uh, and, and as well as the focus will turn to generating returns within fixed income. So uh, the new long-term government bond position uh, should provide um, more duration to the plan, which should help dampen the uh, volatility from the, the plan's increased equity exposure. Uh, and then things like the new high yield and larger investment grade allocations should, uh, should help increase the return contribution of fixed income to the plan. So looking at uh, the investment grade bonds allocation itself, it's likely going to be a composite of short and intermediate duration exposures, um, as well as some portion of securitized exposure. So not just uh, kind of traditionally core bonds. Um, 
we can skip actually to the last slide and I, I'll keep it brief, but of course, uh, we're open to questions at the end, but at the, at the last slide, we have a, uh, some detail on the different strategies that will form the allocation. Uh, so anytime you see a TBD or to be determined there, that that's the work that needs to be done. Uh, so there's a lot of it. Um, uh, in terms of good news, most of the contracting for the passive exposures is nearly completed, and I, I anticipate funding those strategies by month end. Um, so at the same time, we're searching for one or two high yield strategies uh, and an active core bond strategy. Uh, also on the work plan, we had planned on re-underwriting. Uh, the two strategies we have within emerging market debt, and that's kind of, kind of some kind of long uh, standing scheduled event. Uh, so that's also happening now. Um, so uh, clearly lots of work left to do, but there's a, there's a plan to address things in order of priority. Uh, that's, that's the kind of order I presented it in. Uh, but in summary, just to recap, uh, we're at target broadly um, and that, of course, is, is working with the information we have at hand now. Uh, and there's lots of work to do in fixed income. That is where I'm going to stop and open it up to questions if you have any. All right, I'm going to assume we're good. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jay. Uh, so, uh, so as you could clearly, as you can clearly see, fixed income is still a work in progress, and we will continue to update both the IC as well as the board as we make progress uh, towards the strategic asset allocation. And I did want to <clears throat> add one more thing. Uh, we don't often get to brag, so I might as well brag when we get a chance. Uh, we bought the additional 15% public equity when the S&P was at about 2550 or so, or uh, under 2600, and it's at about 7.5%, uh, level 7.5% higher today. These are early days of ghosts, but uh, we will take those gains. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I believe Casey Boyer is online to talk about uh, the private equity report. Um, yes. Before we go on, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, so I think it is better to clarify um, for the whole board members, your fixed income strategies. So the, um, the plan was to allocate up to 8% in long-term great uh, investment grade bond and 2% in, uh, in long-term government bonds and then three percent in uh, in emer emerging market debt and the high yield. Um, can you can Jay clarify for the board what are the uh, investments going to be in each category? Is I you know it's not really one to one match based on your last slide. Sure. So if we can, uh, I think we still yes, have that I, I, last slide. Yeah, we, we still have that last slide up. Uh, we, we can break it down. Uh, and I apologize if this isn't clear. Uh, the, the bottom half should be fairly straightforward. So <clears throat> emerging market debt that has a 3% allocation. Uh, the strategies within EMD right now are Blue Bay EM Select and Wellington Iguazu. Um, as noted, those are both being re-underwritten. Uh, in high yield, uh, there's a 2% allocation. Right now, we don't have any strategies, uh, but again, that's one of the top priorities is to find one or two, uh, one or perhaps two strategies that fit in that space. Um, the cash equivalence line is the immunized net cash flow, um, uh, kind of uh, the five years of net outflow hedging uh, that we have in the plan that, that's run by Insight. The last line on the bottom is the TIPS allocation. So that's funded, that's a passive holding with Northern Trust. Uh, turning to the top of the page then, uh, I'll, I'll start with the easy one, and that's the long-term government 
uh, line in the middle of the page. We're planning on using BlackRock uh, Collective Trust Fund for that. Uh, so uh, as noted, we're in the uh, kind of wrapping up uh, contracting for the uh, passive vehicle there. Should be fairly straightforward, but uh, hoping to have that funded um, either by the end of the month or perhaps sooner. Uh, and then we have the remaining, uh, I think it totals five lines there. So those five lines together will form the 8% uh, that's allocated to uh, this uh, kind of investment grade bonds bucket. And so it, it, as I uh, kind of touched on very briefly, it's going to be a composite of short duration, intermediate, and uh, securitized exposures. Uh, we have a short duration vehicle in place. That's the passive holding uh, that we uh, had been invested in this, this entire time. So that's there. We're, uh, we, we have a core bond, uh, passive uh, ag uh, vehicle open already with Northern Trust. So uh, that's there. We are looking for an active strategy within the uh, kind of core bond space. So uh, I, would, I would put that, you know, in terms of priority a, a little bit after uh, high yield, uh, just within uh, kind of current market opportunities. Uh, maybe if, if we're sooner to fund a high yield strategy, we're, we're perhaps able to uh, catch a little bit of this remaining dislocation period. Um, the last two lines in at the top half of the page, at least, are uh, small allocation to whatever opportunistic uh, strategies we can find. Uh, and I put that in there just as a placeholder in case we come across something. Um, but uh, the, if we compare the current market to something like the, uh, the, the great financial uh, crisis of about a decade ago, there were some, uh, there were some kind of passing opportunities there that uh, that uh, I, I think if we were nimble enough uh, would add value. And so we're seeing some of those opportunities come across our way again. Uh, and the things to compare are, uh, you know, things to consider are what parts of the plan are some of these opportunities more appropriate to be placed in, or, so that's either public fixed income or private uh, credit. Um, and, uh, you know, each, each portion of the plan has different um, you know, different return expectations, risk tolerances, uh, and, and such. So uh, that may or may not get funded, depending on what we see and uh, kind of the, the context of the of the rest of the allocation. Uh, um, the last hold. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. The the last holding is the uh, securitized credit. Uh, strategy and it, it, some of the long, longer tenured trustees might remember uh, we used to have uh, this strategy in the plan. It was redeemed, uh, I believe, at the tail end of 2018 when we changed policy benchmark from uh, global ag to T bill. Uh, so it, it didn't fit in the context of a T bill policy benchmark, but uh, it fit in the context of a global ag or now a, a kind of generalized IG bucket. Uh, so we're looking to fund this up uh, pretty much as soon as possible, uh, given uh, some of the uh, opportunities within the securitized credit space. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's the entirety of what I had slated in, uh, in terms of fixed income strategies going forward. But again, uh, you know, obviously there's room for uh, change here um, in core bond active. Not sure what you know what we may find exactly. Uh, so until we are able to select the strategy and fund that up, the default there will be the uh, passive ag holding. Um, likewise, uh, passive ag will probably be the default for whatever opportunities if not we have left. Um, yeah, I, were there were further questions? Yeah, can I follow up just for clarification? So even though we have established a new policy target for short-term duration bonds at 
um, it sounds to me they're still going to maintain <clears throat> some sort of uh, allocation there. Um, that's my question. Is that correct? The second question is, excuse me. <coughs> so your investment grade bond is going to be split four ways if all funded. One will be a, a passive manage um, aggregate index. Um, one will be core bond actively managed, and then the other one will be uh, the other two will be optimistic, and then uh, um, the securitized debt. Um, is there? Do you have a a, a clear um, plan for the allocation for these strategies? Sure. Yeah. So first, uh, there is going to be some remaining piece of the fixed income. I call it 8% in IG bonds, some remaining piece of that will be in short duration. Um, and that's for, uh, um, I think one of the main reasons there is that the short duration portion uh, or the short duration uh, holding for us, uh, you know, over these past, uh, over this past 18 months or so has been um, helpful in terms of providing liquidity for the rest of the plan for kind of plan operations. So when we have uh, say uh, capital calls or we're redeeming or funding new managers and we need kind of interim passing liquidity, uh, we're not carrying uh, generally, you know, three, four or 5% of plan in cash, um, uh, just as cash. Uh, sometimes we may hold it as cash and then have it overlaid uh, sometimes it might be in this uh, passive short duration vehicle, but generally it's the lowest cost exposure for us to trade in and out of. Uh, it's the easiest uh, exposure to overlay if we're going to hold it as cash and then have it synthetically uh, uh, ex exposed. Uh, and, and so it's, it's one of the, uh, I would call it most nimble allocations. It's going to be a fairly small portion of the IG um, uh, IG bond holding of that 8% going forward. And uh, I'm trying to pull it up now, but it's, it's noted in the IPS uh, when the, uh, yeah, it's noted in the IPS in, in talking about the, uh, the actual weight in, in talking about the policy benchmark for uh, IG bonds. So it's going to be uh, about 25% uh, short duration, 56% ag, and 19% uh, securitized. So in terms of policy benchmark, that's what we're looking at for that, uh, just that 8% portion uh, of the plan that's um, going to be IG bonds. Um, again, so for the, the two core bond vehicles, that's the passive ag, as well as the, the core bond active manager to be selected, um, you know, once, once we select one, uh, those, those two together should be about half or uh, according to policy benchmark, 56% of the allocation. And so until we find uh, an active manager, again, that's clearly, that's all gonna be passive. When we find an active manager, then uh, the bulk of that's likely to be active, um, including uh, whatever, you know, if we don't find an opportunistic strategy, which should be, you know, a very small portion of this whole uh, allocation. Uh, and perhaps I, I think the default for high yield until we find a high yield strategy uh, within fixed income, the default will be uh, that act, uh, passive ag vehicle. Um, so the other, other complicating factor here is that, uh, as, as we noted way earlier, there's overweights in parts of the plan like absolute return that aren't going to get wound down very quickly. And so we, we have to think about, you know, where, if we have overweights there, where, where in the rest of the plan can we be underweight? Uh, and so a large part of that underweight is probably going to be in that short duration. Uh, portion of, of IG bonds. So, you know, it, we might have short duration on paper in terms of policy, but uh, effectively for the next, uh, I don't know, uh, next quarter, next couple quarters perhaps, 
uh, it, it probably uh, won't be funded. Um, was that enough for you? Mm, that's a, that definitely more information than what's previous stated. Um, I'll, I'll reach out to the staff. And then the other, I have another follow-up question. Typically in the, in the, in the BC Ag uh, index portfolio or core bond portfolio, there are always a, some portion allocated to secure, securitize that. So I wonder what are you looking, what exactly is managed by Voya in their securitized credit? Uh, what differentiate that, that part from you know, what's normally um, allocated in those uh, in passive index portfolios? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, as uh, typically, and uh, you're right, and it's in a core bond, uh, especially in an active core bond strategy, they're going to hold some amount of securitized exposure. Uh, but generally, that's going to be, uh, um, you know, higher quality, uh, fairly liquid, uh, securitized holding. So some, uh, some ABS, some agency mortgage, um, and what we're looking to get out of the voice securitized credit is uh, a little bit more variety across the spectrum of different securitized structures. And so uh, they're a fairly comprehensive portfolio focused on uh, security selection. Uh, and while in aggregate, it's the portfolio's investment grade. Uh, some of the holdings do get down below. Uh, so this is, a, uh, if you would, you know, kind of, if I'll, I'll uh, kind of uh, uh, make a real generalization here, but uh, in, in an active core bond strategy, it's going to be very kind of superficial in terms of the securitized exposure. Uh, whereas uh, it, it'll be a little bit more deeper and security selection focused in the securitized credit. Other questions, comments? Thank you, Mr. Polani, Mr. Kwan, for the updates on the transition, um, yeah, as well as the um, uh, update on the, the, the uh, on the prelim with the preliminary numbers on performance for the first quarter. Appreciate that very much. Uh, and Mr. Polani, are we prepared now to go on to Ms. Boyer and 3B? That's right, Mr. Chairman, and I believe we have Ms. Boyer online. Good morning, welcome. Hi. Hi. It's nice to see you all. Um, typically, I do these uh, just over the phone, so it's it's nice for me to actually be able to see faces today um, and uh, be able to present in this manner, although um, not not ideal. Um, so I um, wanted to start off the presentation just um, noting that this is um, Q3 2019 presentation, which means um, in today's world, um, these valuations that you see here will be very dated. Um, and even next quarter, when I present um, the year-end uh, presentation, we, we are actually nearly complete with the financial statements for year-end um, for San Jose Federated. And um, those valuations were likely in, in a majority already set prior to kind of the whole pandemic um, really setting in here in the US. So even next quarter, you likely won't see um, a lot of um, decline from the private equity portfolio. Um, we do expect Q1 and Q2 um, of 2020 to kind of be more of a realistic valuation of, of kind of the current market. Um, and, and that's likely when we will see some of uh, the valuations kind of incorporated into the private equity world. And that's um, been a historical um, uh, kind of uh, tendency within the private equity markets. Um, you'll see kind of public market decline and typically 
coming into LP portfolios, there is a you know quarter to two quarter lag before you kind of see that that valuation um, into uh, private markets. So I'll, I will present um, today what what we have as of um, September 30th, 2019, um, and I, I do see the the presentation there up on the screen. So on page one, um, we just like to give a a general um, update, kind of on the net returns and net metrics for um, Federated. So um, what I'll highlight on this page is uh, we do have 217.5 million committed out of the approximate $260 million that we have available in the Newberger portion. Um, that is about, so it, as of 9.30, about 83% committed, however, um, you'll notice a couple lines down the net contributed capital amount is almost 79 million. That means that um, only about 30% of your total fund, so 30% of 261 million, um, has actually been funded or actually invested to date. Um, we view that as a good thing. So we've, we've made fund commitments. Um, they call capital over time. And um, so you can see that a large portion of your commitment to date will continue to be called and, and provide nice vintage year diversification over the next few years. Um, so today, the total value of the Newberger portfolio is 87.7 million. That includes 85.5 million of net asset value and 2.3 million of distributions that have, have been sent back to uh, the fund. The legacy information is on this page as well. Um, not a lot of change. Those investments are fairly mature at this point. Um, so the returns there are kind of really baked in already. I'll turn to the next page, page two. This uh, page two and uh, a couple of the and the couple of the following pages actually highlight and show the performance of each underlying investment and how that compares to uh, the relevant benchmark, which is uh, Cambridge Associates, which is kind of the widely used peer uh, benchmark comparison within private equity. Um, you can see the performance of each fund. And then on the right, how, the, how that quartiles, both in terms of IRR and uh, multiple of invested capital um, there on the right. Um, I would say compared to Q2, the quartiles are um, largely the same, um, not, not a lot of movement here on, on the legacy uh, investments. Turning to the next page, page three, this is um, the same benchmarking um, uh, using quartiles uh, for the Newberger portion of your private equity portfolio. Um, currently, 2018 to 2019, um, the Cambridge benchmark is not available. Those are still too early to see um, any real relevant information. Um, the first two investments on this page are benchmarked. Um, the second investment there, which is investment number 38, um, that only has, as of 930, one investment, which was held at cost. So primarily what you're seeing there um, is a J-curve effect, meaning management fees have been paid into that um, manager and not a lot of capital has yet to be deployed. 
I would mention this investment and this fund is actually a uh, distressed retail oriented uh, fund. So in today's world, um, we actually are very thankful that they have not deployed a lot up until now. This is kind of their ideal market to take over uh, consumer based retailers um, that uh, are, are slightly distressed. So this should be a very good market for them. Turning to the next page, page four. This is showing your diversification by vintage year. So the commitment amounts that you have made each year. Um, this is at this point in time, a very important chart um, both on page four and page five, it shows vintage year diversification by commitment amount as well as net asset value. So in time periods and, uh, and within private equity, the most important uh, item within a portfolio is diversification, not only within geography and industry, but also across vintage years knowing that you you won't ever really know when a recession um, or a, a huge decline like this is expected to come. Um, the fact that we've already made fund investments and that they are now prepared to deploy into an environment like this um, is is very helpful. So having um, having a a, st a strategy where you're diversified across vintages is very important. So um, you can see here on page four, uh, 2016, 2017 was when we were starting the program. Um, and then 2018, 2019 is when we've been fully investing um, and we will continue to do that and you'll see um, um, in a couple quarters, uh, 2020 on there as well. Um, so I'll, I'll skip page five. That's the same analysis, just using um, net asset value. Turning to page six, the uh, this is showing the performance by asset class both for the legacy portfolio and the Newberger port portfolio and then combining the two. Um, this is showing the performance by multiple of invested capital. Um, obviously still early days for the Newberger portfolio. I would say um, the way the asset classes are developing are exactly what we would expect um, mid cap large cap, um, above cost, but still very much um, still investing and uh, working with their companies. And that, that will be continued um, for the next few years. Um, special situations, we typically do see a little bit higher uh, returns at the beginning. Um, so, so you will see that there. And um, on the next page, page seven, uh, venture capital typically, um, as you all know, uh, does take quite a bit of time to mature. So that that asset class typically is the one that we don't see a lot of uh, value out of until later in a portfolio. Turning to page eight, this is the same analysis, um, just with investment type. So primary, secondary, and co-investments. As a reminder, primary are the fund investments that we're making. Secondaries are typically um, investments into funds on a secondary basis. And then co-investments are when we're actually making investments into companies alongside um, a GP sponsor. Um, so of course, um, secondary and co-investments are um, slightly uh, ahead here of performance, and that's that's what we would expect. We um, use them uh, as capital efficiency, but also return efficiency. Um, those uh, those investment types are put into the ground, and capital is invested immediately, and so you tend to see um, a little bit quicker returns on those. 
um, pages nine and 10 and 11 are the same analysis, just using IRR. So I won't go through those specifically. I'll turn to page 12, um, 12 and 13, which is um, a very detailed look at all the underlying investments within uh, your portfolio, both legacy and Newberger. Um, and you can see all of the gross returns there on the far right. Um, what I would point to on page 13 is just um, some of the totals. So um, the Newberger portfolio um, has now, uh, as of 930, was a little over two years into the program. And at, at, at this point, you can see um, at the bottom as a percent of your total private equity portfolio, it's about 55% of your commitments. And if you, if you look at it in a similar way by fair value, Newberger is about 66% um, of your um, total portfolio. So um, developing nicely and of course, maintaining vintage year diversification. So I, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I know there definitely may be questions. Um, I'm happy to answer anything about market updates or um, you know, what, what we're doing from our side. Any questions from the uh, board members? And Trustee Castellano, can I jump in and ask a couple of questions? Yes, please. Um, hi, Casey. First question on uh, your MOIC, that's a calculation that includes realized and unrealized, right? It includes uh, portfolio markups? Correct. Okay. Um, and then my next question is, yeah, you alluded to it at the end. If you could just provide some commentary, since we tend to get these reports fairly lagged, about what you're seeing right now, both in private equity and venture capital, how uh, firms are reacting in their portfolios to the COVID crisis? Yeah, so um, uh, definitely, so from our side, we, we make investments obviously with lots of different GPs, um, lots of different firms um, in their funds, as well as um, co-investing alongside of them. Um, I would say that um, what we've, and, and we've implemented kind of a, we actually have a, we always monitor our companies and, and funds, but we've taken it a step further where um, we're calling them um, almost weekly, not trying to be um, uh, too much to them, but um, what, uh, things are changing very rapidly. And so trying to get updates on not just what their firm is doing, but how they're working with their portfolio companies. Um, and overall, I would say that we've been very happy and impressed with how GPs are handling this crisis. Um, we found that um, them to be much more proactive and on their feet now, as opposed to, let's say, um, you know, 12 years ago during the, uh, the great financial crisis. So um, they've been uh, very strong. Of course, uh, the strong PE firms, they have, you know, highly experienced tested teams. Um, they have kind of deep investing, operating and capital market resources um, and their mindset and kind of pattern recognition to move urgently and effectively has been um, uh, impressive. So um, what are the GPs focused on? They really are laser focused on making sure that their portfolios can simply survive through this you know, very severe recession. Um, so within portfolio companies, we're seeing GPs implementing hiring freezes, um, and cost reduction plans, um, ensuring there is appropriate cash and liquidity. Um, sometimes this might even mean pulling down, you know, their revolvers just to make sure they have the cash on hand, even if they don't need it today. 
Um, they're proactively working with lenders on capital structures, uh, reviewing capital spending plans, postponing you know, discretionary spending, um, uh, also working on kind of the su supply chain, which obviously has been for some of them disrupted as well. Um, and then uh, I was just talking to a GP yesterday actually, and um, they, they focus on in the software industry. Um, and he said that now is a, is a great time for them to kind of, since they aren't focused on sales right now, which has been largely stopped, um, they're kind of turning their teams and shifting resources to work more on um, their research and development of their software. So they're kind of, they're trying to be um, very uh, efficient and, and working in different ways than they typically would just to kind of take advantage of this time. So um, I would say that in general, um, while this downside case is much more severe than most people had planned for, it people had been anticipating a downturn for a very long time. So, so investors had been, you know, and us as well, working into our analysis downside recession cases before investing. So I think everyone was more prepared this time, although likely not prepared for what has actually happened, which is essentially the turning off of many, many companies. Um, so our downside cases uh, likely weren't, uh, well, they definitely did not expect this with companies, some companies having zero revenue. Um, but um, uh, they're, they're working through it in a much more experienced way, I would say, than, than 10 to 12 years ago. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, this is Trustee Horowitz. So yeah. if I'm looking at the uh, Newberger Berman portion, um, which is mostly vintage 2018, 2019, mm -hmm. it looks like roughly only a third of that has actually been put to work, yep. if I'm reading that correctly. And um, so how long or over what time frame would we expect those two vintages to actually um, be deployed? Yeah, so um, typically with the fund investments, which are the large, part of the unfunded right now. Um, we would expect the 18 and 19 vintages to deploy over the next, to mostly depo deploy over the next two to three years, maybe four years. Um, so uh, that portion, of course, we, we still have um, at least one kind of fund commitment to make and some other commitments to actually invest or commit to, which would then deploy as well um, over a, you know, likely three year time horizon. I'm not sure I quite understood. Are you saying that in, in addition to the investments made, we are also committed to making new investments? There's a small portion. Yeah. If you look on the first page, um, the, the total commitment level at this point is 261.5 million. Today, as of 930, there was 217.5 million committed. Thank you. Yes. Other questions, comments? Boyer, thank you very much. Sorry, I have a question. Um, so of all that committed a project, um, it's a little bit slow for me to react on the mute and unmute. Sorry about that. Uh, on a total, on a committed project, um, how many are showing, um, you know, severe stress 
due to this, uh, you know, this uh, historical uh, economic event. Yeah, so we actually um, just did a presentation to uh, the investment staff uh, last week uh, with that um, exact analysis. So the way, the way we're looking at it right now is uh, uh, we're looking at the impact in the short term and then kind of the medium term. So there's many, many companies who are affected um, in the short term uh, because, you know, if, if you just think through industries, um, retail, uh, traveling, any, any industry, uh, lots, lots of industries, uh, industrials, business services, many of them are very much affected. But um, given the long-term uh, aspect of private equity, that really helps us in environments like this because uh, the investments are expected to be held for um, a longer period of time. So it's important to look at the short-term impact, but it's also important to look at um, the medium to long-term impact. So when we're thinking about um, the medium term, many of the companies, um, the original investment thesis still very much holds it's true. Um, kind of once uh, the, the biggest impact of this is over and kind of once uh, the real world uh, starts working again. So while we don't know when uh, everything will come back online. Um, we do feel like um, in the longer term, the portfolio is still very well positioned. So um, the, the other great aspect of having kind of a, a portfolio within private equity that's well diversified is we have investments in every industry. We have healthcare companies, financial service companies, uh, business services, uh, technology. Technology uh, is mostly focused on software, which um, is uh, helpful in, in this environment, typically because um, it's, if it's you know, software in a small, medium-sized business, um, one, they're not gonna switch um, companies or, or do some massive uh, software change during this time. And, and two, they typically still will need those, um, uh, need those software. So it's not something that they would give up. Um, so uh, there's many different aspects to look at. I would say um, overall, we've been uh, happy with where the, you know, the portfolio is, there's definitely going to be some short term, um, uh, you know, companies that have problems and need to uh, make their way out of this. Um, but in the long term, I think we're, we're uh, very much of the mindset that um, they will get back on track. And um, the thesis for some of those investments um, still hold true um, in the long run. Um, I have a request to the investment team. Um, just wondering if uh, the investment team can share, not in detail, but uh, in a summary level uh, with the board regarding the private equity analysis. So specifically, I'm looking for, and then uh, the value at a risk, um, if, there, if there anything similar to that for this portfolio in, in, a, in a different, scenario yeah uh, this is uh, the cio here uh, we don't use value at risk uh, as you mentioned for private assets uh, but as miss boyer mentioned uh, newberger had an excellent chart that they shared with us in terms of the current portfolio and some of the more stressed aspects of that portfolio and i'd be happy to bring it to the board uh, next month um, is it possible to distribute by email? We certainly can. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions? Okay. 
Okay, Mrs. Boyd, thank you very much again for being with us this morning. Yeah, nice to uh, be here. Yeah, Mr. Polani, would you like to introduce uh, Makita or uh, good morning, uh, Laura and Chris? Yeah, thank there. you. Thank you, Chair Castellano. Yes, I'll turn this over to Laura and uh, Chris from Makita. Okay, thank you. Yes, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. I'm in the uh, the office today for the first time in a month because of a couple of uh, video meetings, and it's very eerie and post-apocalyptic. <laughs> <laughs> so if you see the office behind me, that's why. Um, and I think, um, uh, Linda, do you want to share your screen or should I share mine? Looks like the host has disabled participant screen sharing, so I'll rely on Linda to pull up the... Um... Uh, please share your screen. Okay. It still says disabled. I think I need to be added as a co-host. Here we go. Okay. Here we have the first public markets performance report. I'll make it the full screen here. Great. Um, so this is the fourth quarter performance report as of December 31, 2019. And as you all know, the world has changed quite a bit since that time. So we will look at this performance report since um, it was originally slated to be presented at a prior meeting that was canceled. So that's why it's delayed a bit. Um, it's been done for some time, but I'll also talk about the current economic environment as well. So if you take a look at page four of the report, um, you can see that the world markets during the fourth quarter of 2019 looked very different than they do today. The riskiest asset classes were up quite a bit. Um, the uh, Emerging Markets Equity Benchmark, the MSCI Emerging Markets, was up 11.8%. Um, um, small cap stocks, which is the Russell 2000, were up about 10%, um, followed by you know near double digit returns for several other asset classes. Um, as we sit here today, um, Laura, have, yes. can I interrupt? Sure. Are you doing uh, the presentation for uh, three point? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, so there, there is a three three C. That's a private market. Are you doing oh, the private oh, market one, or are you doing the next one? Sorry about that. I'm doing the uh, the general total fund. We can typically that's on the agenda first. Sorry about that. We can start with private markets if you'd prefer. But that's okay, since you're a star, I just want to make it clear. I'm sure I'm not the only person who's opening the wrong um, presentation. Oh, I'm, I apologize. Uh, I, I had assumed that it was um, uh, the total fund first, uh, as usual. Is it, is it all right, Jair, if I continue on with this one? I have no objection to that, I'm sure. That's but fine, thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, if, if it's possible, I, th I do think it makes sense to discuss the total market environment and the total fund before we delve into the, um, the private markets. So um, in terms of the current market environment, we, we now sit here today with over 2 million confirmed coronavirus cases, um, probably many more that have not been tested and about 140,000 deaths globally. Um, on the positive news front, it does seem that most um, uh, countries that have had sustained outbreaks have been able to flatten their curves. Um, uh, new cases of the virus have declined and plateaued in China, though there is some um, question about how accurate their data is. And if we look at market returns now, um, in contrast to this page four, if we take a look at them um, through yesterday, so April 15th, um, for the year-to-date period, U.S. stocks, um, the S&P 500 was down 13.3%. Non-U.S. stocks, um, the MSCI EFA index, were down 21.4% and emerging market stocks were down 20%. Um, in contrast, bonds have performed well. Um, the Bloomberg Barclays Aggregate Index was up 4.8% through yesterday, tips up 5.1%. Um, high yield, um, as uh, Mr. Kwan discussed earlier, um, spreads did widen quite a bit and high yield was down 8.1% through yesterday. So um, as your CIO mentioned, the diversified portfolio definitely has protected better than um, the broad equity universe. Um, 
at the end of 2019, the S&P 500's five-year return was almost 12%, and that was far above the um, bond universe return of 3.1%. Um, now, however, the recent decline in stocks has brought long-term returns to be pretty similar um, to U.S. bonds. Um, also, in terms of the market environment, a couple other things I wanted to highlight. Um, we have had historic stimulus, as you all know. Um, the uh, U.S. fiscal response has been materially larger um, in dollar terms than what they provided during the global financial crisis. It's also um, focused pretty um, in a focused way on certain industries and sectors that have been hit the hardest. Um, we can measure the stimulus this time in weeks, not years. Um, you know, during the global financial crisis, it was several years of, of similar stimulus. Um, also, the, the monetary stimulus, stimulus has focused on corporate debt um, and, um, and small businesses and that sort of thing. Um, oil prices have dropped precipitously, but um, recovered a bit recently. And then interest rates, as we discussed a little bit earlier during Mr. Kwan's um, fixed income presentation, are very different than they were one year ago or in recent history. The 10-year Treasury yield is now at 0.64%. One year ago, it was at 2.6%, and 10 years ago, it was at almost 4%. So we have much lower um, yields currently. Um, as uh, this uh, current crisis grew into a pandemic, um, investors' preferences um, shifted to holding U.S. dollars rather than non-U.S. currencies. Um, the Federal Reserve has worked with a number of global central banks to reestablish the U.S. dollar swap program um, to provide some relief to other currencies um, since it's very difficult for overseas customers um, to purchase goods when the dollar is so strong. Sorry, was there a question? Okay, so um, unemployment is the other big story um, that has um, obviously changed quite a bit since this report was put together. Um, we now have a four week total at 22 million um, unemployment claims. Um, the real unemployment rate is probably close to 18%. The last reported one was using figures from March 13th, so over a month ago. Um, and at the time, it, the unemployment rate was only 4.4%. But um, when we incorporate all of these new claims, it will probably be much higher. Um, we've only had one month in the past 30 years with a double-digit unemployment rate of 10%, and that was back in October of 2009. Um, let's see, in terms of um, looking forward, um, you know, we all know that we're going to have a recession. We're, we're already in a recession. Um, the big question is how deep it will be and how long it will last. Um, there's a number of factors that play into that, as you know, we all read in the media, um, the amount of testing and how soon we're able to relax some of the current restrictions in place will certainly have a major impact on how serious the market response continues to be. Um, you know, I think um, San Francisco and Santa Clara County um, are maybe some of the, the better places to live and, and being in California with um, the measures that were taken earlier and um, flattening the curve. And, you know, I do find it somewhat hopeful that the conversation has moved from how do we flatten the curve and relieve, um, you know, pressure on hospitals to more of how do we move forward and how do we try to reopen. Um, and hopefully um, throughout the rest of the year, we will see some economic improvements. So I'm happy to take any questions on the market environment or we could skip into performance. Any questions on um, uh, 3D? I can go ahead and, um, and go to take a look at um, page 18. This is sort of the overview of the fourth quarter of 2019. You can see the total assets were at 2.2 billion as of the end of the year. That was an increase of 91 million from September 30, 2019, despite cash outflows of about 8 million. Um, there were two new investment managers added during the quarter. You can see in the bottom bullet here, the back BlackRock one to three year government credit in short term investment grade bonds and the Northern Trust Aggregate Bond Index in investment grade bonds. If you recall, during the fourth quarter, you all moved from some more cash-like short-term bond holdings that were benchmarked to cash, essentially, um, to more short-term bonds, which turned out to be a good thing in the recent market environment as longer duration did better. 
Um, uh, finally, American Core Realty, which had been in liquidation mode for a while, was fully uh, liquidated, as were two hedge funds, Marshall Waits and Sandler. Taking a look at uh, page 25, you can see the total um, current allocation relative uh, to targets on the far right. These have changed, as you know, since the end of the year, given your recent actions on asset allocation. But as of the end of the year, each asset class was quite close to its target at the time. Looking at the total fund, the fourth quarter 2019 return was 4.5%. Um, if you look at the total one year, so the total 2019 calendar year, the return was 14% um, and outperformed both the policy benchmark and the investable benchmark portfolio. And you can see quite strong double digit one year returns across uh, public equity in terms of global equity, US equity, international, and even emerging markets. If you take a look at private markets, um, they were also up 18.4% for 2019, private equity in particular up 24.7%. Much of that was because many of the assets that are slated to go to private markets were housed in the Russell 3000 index, which was up 31.2% for 2019. Um, even looking further down the page, if you look at zero beta, which is now um, called low beta, and we've updated that in the investment policy statement that we'll uh, provide a bit later, um, zero beta was up uh, over 2% beyond its benchmark for the year of 2019. Um, absolute return was up 9.7% relative to its benchmark of 2.4. So also quite strong returns from your hedge fund portfolio. In terms of individual manager performance, it continues to be quite strong. If you um, take a look on the far right, we have um, since inception returns for these managers in your portfolio. And many of your active managers are in the top quartile or at least above median. So you've seen quite strong returns from your active managers in your portfolio. Um, one is the best ranking in the peer universe and 100 is the worst. So artisan global value here in the 15th percentile since you hired them, artisan global opportunities in the 19th percentile, Cove Street, which if you recall struggled quite a bit for a couple of years, um, now back near median and has, has had strong returns recently. Um, one manager that I'll highlight in particular is GQG Global Emerging Markets. They're down here at the bottom of page 32 under emerging markets equity. Um, they have done quite well for you since you hired them with a return of 8.4% per year versus 6.6 .6 for MSCI emerging markets. They did have um, a rough uh, sort of uh, late 2019 period, but we're seeing really strong returns for them. They're known to protect on the, on the downside. So during the first quarter of 2020, they outperformed the MSCI emerging markets benchmark by over 4%. Uh, I will skip down a few pages um, just to highlight. I mentioned that there was a shift from BlackRock three-month T-bills under short-term investment grade bonds um, to BlackRock one to three-year government credit. And that ended up being a, a good move um, once we will take a look at the first quarter of 2020. Um, as I mentioned, your hedge funds um, were quite strong, especially if you look at the one-year returns here. Um, outperformance um, to a significant level from most of your managers in the space. Um, with that, I will wrap up other than to say that when we look at all of the standard deviation numbers for really the one, three, five, and 10 year period, the risk level in the portfolio later on in the report, we have some slides on that, but I won't go through every um, other slide of the many left. Um, standard deviation or volatility has been much lower for your portfolio over all time periods than the peer group. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to jump the gun earlier on that. No, <laughs> um, no. Yeah. Uh, questions, comments uh, for item 3D? Yeah, Laura, um, I noticed that you always have the attribution of the portfolio performance uh, provided, information provided in the presentation, but you never go through that. Do you mind going through the attribution with us? Sure. Yeah, attribution is a bit of a tricky thing because um, if you change your asset allocation, that has a major impact on how the attribution looks. Um, so as you know, the asset allocation was shifting throughout um, 2019 and it will continue to into 2020. So I would take these numbers with a bit of a grain of salt. 
Um, the other thing that the attribution doesn't necessarily take into account is, you know, it might say that your public equity managers underperformed. Um, in this case, they were mostly outperforming their individual benchmarks, um, but because there was maybe a value or a small cap bias in the San Jose portfolio, it appears as if they um, detracted um, on a manager selection basis. So um, that's one reason that I don't go through um, attribution in too much detail is because, you know, I do think we should take these, these uh, numbers with a grain of salt. Um, if you look at the three month time period on, uh, on page 46, you can see that it appears that allocation among uh, asset classes was positive um, and that selection detracted. Um, but as I mentioned, there are some caveats to that. You take a look at the one year period and you look at the total fund, you can see that the selection effect and the asset allocation effect were strong relative to the benchmark. Thank you. Of course, and if there's ever any slides that I don't touch on that, that you wanna dis discuss further, please let me know. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, this is uh, Trustee Horowitz. Yes. Along the same vein, um, it seems like the selection effect for public equity has consistently been a negative contributor. Uh, I believe that's illustrated on, on slide 56. Is that correct? Uh, yes, and I think if you take a look at slide 58, that will provide some information as well. You can see that the, the allocation to equity has been quite low relative to peers as well. So you have a sort of a double whammy of detraction. You have um, some positioning within public equity, mainly, as I mentioned, a small cap and value, which have been out of favor. Um, and then you also have, you know, a much lower weight than, um, than peers. And, you know, as you all know, living in Silicon Valley, really, if you didn't have a lot of exposure to a few large cap tech stocks during 2019, it looked as if you didn't do well. So the underperformance is largely due to overweighting small, uh, this slide is the one I was interested in, yes, mm -hmm. quarterly underperformance. Uh, so this consistent uh, underperformance was largely due to the an overweight in small cap and value, is that? Um, within, within public equity, those were detractors as was um, a bit more exposure to emerging markets equity um, than, than US, which has just been so dominant really since the global financial crisis. Right. And it's come back the fastest since we hit the bottoms at, on March 23rd. That's very true. If you look at um, long-term valuations, um, emerging markets look very undervalued relative to the rich pricing in U.S. equity, but U.S. equity has certainly outperformed. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps that's something we need to consider. Yes, and we did with your um, updated asset allocation sort of cap emerging markets equity at a certain level, even though um, the quantitative analysis would have higher weights there. But I meant also with respect to uh, value and small cap. Um, there certainly seems to be indications that large cap and growth stocks will continue to dominate um, going forward for a variety of structural reasons. I think that's a fair point. Uh, excuse me, this is uh, um, staff, uh, Christina Wan. Um, may I add something? Please, Christina. Okay, thanks. Um, so, um, uh, as Laura mentioned, um, the small cap and value tilt has um, hurt the portfolio and the allocation to value, um, for example, global um, artisan global value has out, um, largely um, been larger than um, artisan global opportunities, as well as our allocation to small value um, passive instrument, as well as a small value uh, active manager. We have actually made some changes to the plan over the past quarter um, in, in March. Um, so we have increased our growth. So to balance the, the value and growth tilt, for example, um, to um, make the shift from Russell one plus Russell two value to a Russell three passive instrument, as well as more allocations to artisan global opportunities so that value and growth are more balanced right now, rather than a, a very clear tilt to wa toward value. Just want to make that update. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Other questions? Okay. 
next um i'm doing a time check it's 9 50 we have the 10 o'clock time certain um shall we go on then or go back to 3c sure let's uh let's see Screen sharing has stopped. I'm not sure why. Okay, Chris, do you want to discuss? Great. Good morning, it's Chris Theodore from Makita. Uh, Laura had pulled up the document titled Private Markets Program Public Version. Uh, as a reminder, this presentation is as of the third quarter 2019 and is the public version. Uh, staff does receive a more detailed private version uh, with some added details at the asset class level. Uh, in addition to this being in our new Makita brand, we've also revamped our private markets reports and added some enhanced reporting capabilities uh, that we hope you all will enjoy, but would appreciate any feedback that you might have as towards the content of the slides. Uh, we'll start the presentation on page three. Uh, the federated system is detailed here. The federated system consists of legacy private equity, the Newberger Fund of One, private debt, real estate, and real assets uh, with committed capital of roughly 880 million uh, and a remaining value of roughly 270 million. Uh, if we jump into page five, we'll start our reporting with private debt. Uh, this is a, uh, a pretty new chart here on page five. Uh, private debt overall uh, represents $65 million for the federated system, uh, which is equal to 3.1% of the overall system. Uh, versus a 4% target. Uh, you'll note with your new asset allocation, uh, which was decided upon recently, your private debt allocation was decreased from 4% to 3%, uh, and that will be introduced in future reports. Uh, the chart here, uh, I think, is helpful for uh, visual learners. Um, details commitments by vintage year uh, with the blue bars, as well as remaining value uh, with the green line. Continue through to page six. Page six details recent quarterly commitments. Uh, there were no commitments for the private debt program. Um, flipping through to page seven. Uh, this details quarterly cash flows, including contributions for the quarter, as well as distributions for the quarter. And continuing through, I'd like to jump to page nine. Uh, page nine details your investment performance by vintage year. Uh, you'll see that the total private debt program consists of uh, eight uh, investments there it does toward the bottom the total line is committed capital of 215 million uh, remaining value of 65 million with an IRR of 4.4 percent. Uh, page 10 will show since inception performance over time uh, with the chart detailing trailing five-year performance uh, as well as the chart below Detail and private debt programs performed over the one, three, five, ten, and since inception periods. And continuing through, I'd like to jump to page 12. Uh, this details performance for the program at the asset class level, which was similar to the slide we would show in our previous report um, with your eight uh, investment commitments listed here on page 12. Pages 13, 14, and 15 also break out private debt by strategy, vintage year, and geography, and are our new slides to the, the private markets report. Um, if we continue through page 17, this jumps into the real estate. I'm sorry, page 16. jumped into the real estate program. Uh, the real estate program consisted of committed capital of $194 million to 12 closed end real estate funds. Uh, the real estate program's uh, asset value is $55.2 million as of September 30th, 2019, uh, equal to 2.6% of the retirement system versus a 3% target. And that 3% target should stay consistent with the new asset allocation. Uh, similar to the private debt program, uh, we have the same slides listed for each of the private markets asset classes. Um, so in the essence of saving time, I didn't want to touch base on each of the slides like I did for private debt. 
But on page 18, we'd like to note that there is a, I'm sorry, 17, there is a new commitment to DRA 10 uh, for $10 million in the third quarter of 2019. Um, and then if we jump to page 23, showcases investment performance, strong performance in the real estate portfolio. Um, keep in mind the time period noted in this report through the third quarter of 2019 uh, with the bull market cycle uh, long in the tooth, I guess looking in hindsight from today. Um, but we see a, a, an IRR of 5.9 um, and remaining value of $55.2 million. Uh, we jump to page 30, jumps into real assets. I'm sorry, I think I had the different slide numbers, but if we jump to the real assets slide, Laura, the cover real assets slide. Thank you. Um, the total reported value uh, was $23.4 million as of September 30th equating to 1% of the 1.1% of the overall retirement system versus a 3% target. Um, this program is uh, younger uh, in its inception than the other programs, smaller committed dollar amounts and a smaller number of investments with only four investments towards real assets. Uh, if we continue through, if we could jump to the, I had it as page 34, but to performance, Laura, there we go. Uh, performance on page 31, um, there is four investments, um, two energy, two infrastructure investments um, with a remaining value of 23.4%. Uh, and much of the performance in this portfolio is not meaningful uh, as the investments have been committed to quite recently and are undergoing the J-curve experience. Any questions on the private markets program? Any questions? Uh, yes, this is Trustee Horowitz. Um, <clears throat> going back to your to your slide twenty three. Uh, so we can see the performance of the different uh, vintage years versus the benchmark, uh, but this asset class is also accessible through public markets. Is it possible to also present uh, another column uh, alongside this already busy slide uh, showing a public markets equivalent, uh, showing a, uh, an index of REITs, for instance? Um, it is possible. Um, calculating a public markets equivalent is a enormous undertaking because all of these um, funds call capital both for fees and uh, new commitments and make distributions. Um, uh, very regularly, and so you need um, very accurate daily pricing and, and dates on the cash flows, and there's some, some subjectivity there. Um, and we don't necessarily have all that data for some of the past funds um, from before we worked with the plan. Um, so it, it is something that we could, we could it would be easier to start to um, do that going forward and for some of the ones that are in the portfolio more recently. Uh, well, I think it would be uh, important to, I, I have no way to evaluate whether the 5.9% the IRR is that superior to what we could have earned in, in a public market. Um, it's unfortunate we didn't have any vintage year 2009-2010, because yeah. uh, I think they would have been great outperformers. Um, but the benchmark itself um, doesn't tell me everything I need to know, or I think what we need to know about uh, what, what value added we are seeing by going with uh, private markets versus public here. Yes, you're correct. There's certainly a lot of really strong vintage years that were missed. Um, the board and staff, prior board and staff at the time were very focused on building the hedge fund portfolio at that time. And so some other asset classes took a back seat. Um, but we, we can try to add more here that, that would show you some public markets equivalents. Whatever type of approximation you can uh, generate maybe that doesn't create so much work i realize that doing a complete honest apples to apples pme equivalent would would be probably a great undertaking but something your appendix has some information that alludes to this but it's not very uh, specific to years so we'll chat with our private markets reporting team and see what we can do 
Much appreciated. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Other questions, comments on uh, 3C? Yeah, actually, can I make a quick comment? Um, notwithstanding uh, Laura's willingness to do some of that work, also convenient back of the envelope is to, you know, assume what 500 to 500 basis points is what you want to see above the S and P and S and P 500 sort of for the illiquidity um, that you pay for or have to deal with when you go into private assets. So, you know, we're we're actually expecting some form of outperformance uh, versus public markets, and we could just do, you know, some. The S and P won't be a direct match for all of the different private equity and venture capital managers we have, but at least in, in the short run, we could at least see if we're really getting the benefit of that illiquidity premium. Yes, and that's sort of similar to the work we've done, as you know, for the um, the retirement working group, where we showed sort of long term returns for the programs relative to public markets, and in general, private markets has done better, you know, as a whole. But in terms of individual funds, we can try to do something there also. Uh, Trustee Horowitz, again, that would be very interesting, but with respect to real estate specifically, I would expect the comparison would be with, with public tr publicly traded REITs, not with the um, S&P 500 as a whole. I believe the benchmark is actually the NACREEP Odyssey, which is core public real estate, um, which is a little bit more similar. Um, the one that we showed um, in other documents um, has a little bit more similar characteristics to private real estate, but is valued much more frequently. Um, so the um, the National Council on Real Estate Investing um, puts out a, a, a quarterly liquid core real estate um, benchmark, and I believe that's what we used at the time. Right. I just want to make the distinction that a comparison to the S&P 500 as a whole would not be. Uh, yes. Yeah. And the REIT index is going to be way more volatile than private um, real estate, but it is a, an alternative you could consider. Mm -hmm. If you'll note in the public markets report that Laura presented, uh, we do benchmark private real estate versus the increased property index. And since inception, the private real estate portfolio has gained 17% um, versus 7.6% for the benchmark. So very nice outperformance here in private real estate. On a time-weighted basis when you can uh, look at the apples to apples. Yeah. Okay. Other Questions, follow up. Thank you again, <clears throat> Laura and Chris. I, I know you've got a couple of uh, uh, other items on the agenda. But it's uh, now 10.03. Uh, we need to switch over to the time certain. Um, Mr. Polani, are we prepared to go? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. we, we'll come back to the IPS revisions <clears throat> after this uh, item. Uh, I believe we have uh, the finance director online, uh, Ms. Cooper. We have the budget director, Mr. Shannon. Uh, so we have a star-studded cast here along with Mr. Pena, uh, Mr. Liederman, and maybe even Mr. Hallmark said he could join us uh, if time permits. So all of them will correct me if I make a mistake uh, on this very interesting discussion. Uh, so just a note on process uh, before we get to the meat of this. Uh, typically, uh, this is a discussion that's had at the investment committee level, not at the board level. And uh, I did speak to Mr. Lederman, and uh, Mr. Lederman advised me that since the IC is a subset of the board, uh, it makes sense to just have this at the board and not have an extra meeting at the IC level. And hence, this discussion is happening at the board level. So, so what is pre-funding and what is before us today? Um, now, as you all know, the city is required to make uh, contributions to the retirement plan. And typically this is done on a monthly basis or a bi-weekly basis. Now, the city has the right under the municipal code to also make its contributions in a lump sum at the beginning of the fiscal year. So the municipal code vests the right with the city, the authority with the city to make that uh, lump sum contribution at the beginning of the year. Now, since 2008, 2009, uh, if my notes are correct, the city has opted to pre-fund its retirement contributions. And they've done that every year, except for last year. Uh, last year, the city opted not to pre-fund its retirement contributions. Now, while the city has the authority to pre-fund its retirement contributions, 
the boards have the authority to determine what the discount rate should be for pre-funding those contributions. And then the boards and the board's uh, actuarial consultant actually calculate what is called the actuarial equivalence of the discount rate. And I'll get back, I'll get into that uh, in a little bit. So just to make it clear, the city has the right to pre-fund its retirement contributions and the board has the right to determine what that discount rate should be. Now from 2008, 2009, all the way to 2015, the board simply used the assumed rate of return as the discount rate. In 2015, the board's investment committee asked our fiduciary council to find out if we can actually vary the discount rate. And, and we got an opinion from our council that we can actually discount the contributions at a different rate than the discount rate. And so staff came up with a methodology to come up with a different discount rate. Now let's pause for a minute here and think about why we would need to change that discount rate. So we have the ability to either incentivize the city to pre-fund retirement contributions or to disincentivize the city from pre-funding retirement contributions. Now, when would you want to incentivize the city to pre-fund retirement contributions? You do that typically when we're in a contraction phase when valuations are low, then we believe that if those contributions are pre-funded, then we can actually deploy that capital and get you know, a decent rate of return. However, if we are in an expansion phase and if valuations are high, we have the ability to disincentivize or discourage the city from pre-funding contributions because we don't believe we can actually return a fair amount on those pre-funded contributions. So the board came up with the method, the, the st staff came up with the methodology and the boards approved this methodology in 2015. So staff went back and looked at data over you know, the last 150 years and we looked at economic expansions and the average economic expansion was about 54 months. And so staff had came up with this incremental approach to determining the discount rate, whereby if in a year, the expansion had crossed 54 months and or the S&P had gained 130% from its last bear market bottom, then we will discount, we will apply a haircut or a discount to that rate of 15%. So we will reduce the discount rate by 15%. So we are slightly disincentivizing the city from doing that because we are in an expansion and we've been in a bull market. Now, if for a second year this continues, and again, we are in an expansion, and once again, the market is high, we would reduce that discount rate by another 15%. And so on, and in the third year, we would again reduce it by another 15% for a maximum reduction of 45% over the discount rate. And that would disincentivize the city from pre-funding its contributions because markets are elevated, we are, ex we are expecting a recession and we don't wanna deploy all that capital. And this is what happened last year, the full 45% discount uh, rate the 45% reduction of the discount rate was applied and the city decided not to pre-fund its retirement contribution. So if you look at staff methodology, it says that these numbers, whether we are in an economic expansion or not, and are we in a bull market or not, goes to September 1st of the prior year. And that's the date that we take into account. Now, in a normal, slow moving economic cycle, I think it makes a lot of sense to look at September 1st of the previous year and say, you know, yeah, this is a long running expansion, 50, 60, 70, in the last one of over hundred months. It makes sense to go back and look at some really good solid data from the prior year. 
But one thing we have to keep in mind now, so if we, if we apply that methodology and if we look at September 1st of last year, and if you look at the S&P's level, we would apply the full 45% discount uh, reduction to the discount rate. And we would discourage the city from pre-funding. But it is important to keep in mind that we are in a very different economic environment today than we were on September 1st. So clearly, and we don't need official government data to tell us that, we are in a contraction phase as of today. We've had an unprecedented seizure of economic activity. Also, if you look at the S&P, we bounced back off the low, but it's not clear that we are in a bull market yet. And the CFA Institute says that you are in a bull market if after six months after hitting the bear market low, if you're 20% above. And it's only been a month or so since we hit the low. Uh, and we are about 20% higher than the low, but the market is so volatile that we don't know. Uh, so it's not clear that we are in a bull market yet. So if you apply that methodology today, as opposed to September 1st, you can clearly say that we are not in a bull market and that we are not in an economic expansion. So if you apply, and so if you take into account today's context, we can say that the discount rate should not be reduced and the city should be given the full discount rate of 6.75%. But let me also talk about the actuarial equivalence of the discount rate. So if the city were to pre-fund its retirement contribution and we get that amount on July 1st, 2020, now, clearly, there are some payments that have to go out every month. So the payments that go out the first month is not of much value to us because we cannot profit from that because we only have 30 days to invest that. And the outflow of the second month is a little bit more valuable to us because we now have 60 days with that amount and so on and so forth until we get to the 12th month where we can actually, we actually have a full year's worth of money to invest. And so you have to view this ideally as a bond. And we have biweekly uh, pay periods in the city. So we, I, I believe we have 26 pay periods. So ideally you should look at this, you should discount this backwards as a bond with 26 cash flows, cash outflows. But in reality, and for practical purposes, what Chiron has done is they've actually taken the midpoint. And so the way the calculation works is if you're applying the full discount rate of 6.75%, you take the square root of 1.0675 and you subtract one from it and that gives you 3.3%. So the effective discount rate would be 3.3%. So instead of $100, the city will then will pay us $96.70. Now, just to contrast, contrast this for a minute with, if we take the old methodology by, by letter, not just spirit, by letter, and if we apply the September 1st uh, date to come up with whether we are in an expansion or a bull or bear market, we would have discounted that we would have reduced that 6.75% by 45%, which comes to 3.71%. And the actuarial equivalent of that would be 1.8%. So if we follow that September 1st date, we would offer the city a discount of 1.8% to pre-fund retirement contributions. But it is our opinion that they should actually get the full 3.3% and not 1.8% because we are not in an expansion phase and we are not firmly in a bull market yet. Um, so Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna pause there. I know I said a lot of things. Uh, I'm gonna pause there. Hopefully that was clear. I tried to simplify this discussion and I know we have many experienced people here who can answer questions along with us. And so I'm gonna turn this over to you. Um, I, I'd like to start with a question, please. And I don't, Mr. Polani, this may be before your time, uh, uh, in which case Mr. Pena or someone else can, can uh, uh, kick in. The, um, 
the issue about incentivizing or or discouraging I guess I'm trying to get a better sense of the entire picture before we dig into the issue and we move towards action. Um, just the in, in the issue, the idea of incentivizing and discouraging. It seems, in my simplistic view, it seems to uh, has a emotional connotation. I would have thought um, at first glance that if the city chose to exercise its right to uh, front end that it would be just a matter of actuarial equivalent based on market conditions. Um, and, and maybe that is what's actually happening mathematically, but just the, the fact that we're using those words, incentivize or discourage seems to suggest that there, there may be something else going on um, in determining a number other than the actuarial equivalent. It, can you, someone say something about that? Why are we even saying those words and not just talking about the actuarial equipment? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump in, uh, Chair Castellano, and I'm going to let the others uh, talk to this, add to this, uh, who've been here before me. And so I'm, I'm using the words incentivize and disincentivize, They're actually taken from the memo written by uh, this Barn Andrew. The CIO, uh, yeah, a few years ago. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if I don't think there's necessarily an emotional component to this, though the wording may suggest uh, that it's it's strictly based on a formula and what is in the best interest of the plan. And clearly, if if we are long in the tooth of an economic expansion or a bull market, we don't necessarily want to give a great discount to the city and have the burden of producing those returns and vice versa. But I let Mr. Pena and the others add to that. Um, thank you, Prabhu. Uh, no, I think you explain it exactly uh, the right way. Um, you are correct, uh, Chair Castigiano. Um, the exercise is an actuarial, actuarial equivalence. But um, again, depending on where we are, I'm not a dentist, but as uh, Prabhu indicated, long on the tooth, is that what you said, Prabhu, about the economic expansion? You know, obviously, it's going to be harder for the plan to produce those returns. And so once we get a lump sum payment, we have to deploy those funds. And if we don't expect the market to continue going up because there's been a, a strong economic expansion like we were experiencing back in 15 and 16, then we felt, hey, I know they have the right to, they meaning the city has the right to uh, uh, pre-fund the contributions, but we may want to decisify them by uh, decreasing the savings that they will receive. And in fact, we did. I mean, they still went ahead and prefunded the contributions up to the point where the savings were so uh, small that uh, I don't want to speak for the city. Either they didn't see the, 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 the reason or the gain from, from the savings, or maybe there were all the issues related to city cash flow. I can't speak to that, but I think that's uh, that's what the those uh, the descriptions or those words are are coming from. Okay. All right. Thank you. Other uh, questions, comments from Mr. Polani at this point. Uh, Trustee Horowitz here. I'm trying to get my head around exactly how many dollars are at stake. Uh, did we back test this to see if the city pre-funded every year for, I don't know, the last five or, or 10 years versus uh, the alternative methodology, I guess, of paying in every month or every quarter, what would be the total dollar effect? Uh, so uh, Trustee Horowitz, last year, uh, the amount well, the last year the city elected not to prefund, but the year before that they did elect to prefund, and uh, they paid us a total of three hundred and fifty-eight million dollars for both plans, including the healthcare trust, and the Fed, the federated portion of that was one hundred and fifty-four million, and the federated healthcare trust was twenty-one million, and the rest was police and fire. So that just gives you an idea of the magnitude of the numbers. And as I had mentioned before, they did pre-fund every year going back uh, to 2008, 2009. Okay. Other questions before we proceed? 
Okay, uh, Mr. Pilani, do you want to move forward? Is this a time for council to um, talk about um, council's memo? Uh, sure. Mr. Chairman, this is Harvey Lederman. Morning. Good morning. Uh, I think it's been covered very well uh, so far. Uh, and uh, if there are any questions, happy to discuss it. Essentially, we're talking about the board's uh, comfort with um, its assessment of the, both the time value of money coming in and the time risk of money coming in uh, at this time. And uh, I think uh, CIO Polani has explained it very uh, accurately. It's really the actuarial equivalence is really a determination the board makes uh, in this instance on trying to assess uh, the short term likelihood of making the assumed rate of return um, that it assumes over the long run. And so um, I think, um, it, although we haven't had a specific actuarial advisory on this particular subject um, this week or, or this month, um, I think the board has already over the last couple of meetings in talking about um, moving the asset allocation, uh, the board has already um, expressed its views uh, that it believes that we are in a recessionary time with an opportunity uh, that if we have additional cash to deploy, we would deploy it into the markets in a re reasonable basis. So I think we do have a record um, of our last few board meetings where the board has generally expressed um, a near unanimous, if not unanimous view uh, that it expects uh, short-term return rates in the markets to equal or exceed the long-term assumed rate of return. And therefore the CIO's recommendation that this is a time when the uh, full impact of the discount rate can be uh, offered to the city as the actuarial equivalence of the city paying not in one lump sum as of July 1, but over 26 uh, pay periods. Um, the, the, the assessment, of course, uh, in the past has been made looking backwards to a September 1 date simply because that that data was seen to be the most reliable and we had long-term trends. Um, we're in the middle of a trend right now. The board has clearly expressed its view that it believes that not only in April, but certainly in July and beyond that that trend is going to continue in the markets. And I think that is the advice from our consultants, our investment consultants at Makita as well. Uh, so this is uh, perhaps a long way of saying that I believe the board has uh, exercised its judgment um, over the last couple of meetings about what the actuarial equivalence of uh, between getting all the money in now and being able to deploy it in the market today versus the money coming in over 26 pay periods and deploying it on a more dollar cost averaging basis. Um, and that, that equivalence is the full discount rate. I'm happy to answer any questions from the legal perspective, but I think at this point, it's really a question of the board's um, assessment collectively of the time value of money and the time risk of money in today's markets. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Sun, or did you have a question? Oh, no, I don't. Okay, I'm sorry. My, my screen moved over towards you. Um, uh, Mr. Pawnee, could you um, please clarify exactly what action you would need from the board on this matter? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So typically uh, this would have been discussed at the investment committee and we would have explained the methodology approved by the board previously 
uh, to the IC and stated you know, the discount rate that we are offering to the city and the IC would review and approve this. And then I would write a memo to the finance director. And since we are now presenting this to the board instead of the IC, the board will now take the place of the IC in approving this uh, interpretation of the memo and offering the city the full discount uh, of 6.75%, the actual equivalent of the full discount of 6.75%. Um, so that would be the action, unless Mr. Lederman or Mr. Pena uh, feel that there's anything to add to that. And can both of those matters be addressed in one motion? They, they, they can. And again, Prabhu did an excellent job explaining. I, I guess uh, it will be, and I, I, Prabhu has been leading this item, so I have to apologize. But um, before we get to the point, Chair, I wonder if it would make sense to hear from the finance director and the budget director, um, just to provide some background. We did receive uh, a few months back uh, through email communication from the finance director from the city that the city had elected not to pre-fund this year, but that was before the COVID-19 pandemic and the current situation uh, and opportunities, I guess, uh, on the market which led uh, Prabhu and I to discuss this issue and reach out to the uh, finance director um, just to let her know, hey, you know, uh, I recognize the city had elected not to perform the contributions, but if there was ever a time that the city may want to consider doing so, we'll be in this type of market, which is the reason we're having the discussion here this morning. I wonder, uh, if we should, uh, before we proceed, we having any kind of motions, if we should allow the city finance director and the budget director to speak, either speak on the matter or ask any questions, um, because at this point, I'm not even aware whether or not the city is in fact considering pre-funding or not. Uh, yes, that's fine. Is uh, Ms. Cooper on the line right now? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. This is Julia Cooper, the city's finance director, and Jim Shannon's also on the phone. So yeah. um, I'll start off. So um, thank you for, for um, taking this matter up. And um, if you proceed, um, I understand you would also have to have a special meeting at the Police and Fire Retirement Board as well. But um, the, the issue came up because, you know, we did, we did have a long history of doing the pre-funding. And so um, we were doing investments to essentially come to a July 1st date. So we do have cash that is maturing um, in July of this year that would put us in a position to at least partially pre-fund the contribution, which would be about $82 million. Um, and we're also, um, as a result of the whole COVID crisis, um, the federal government has offered a municipal uh, liquidity facility borrowing program that we're examining. Because you may be aware that um, historically, when the city did do a pre-funding, we did it as a combination of cash and borrowed short-term borrowing. So uh, at this point, we've just done some initial analysis on pre-funding with cash and are looking if, you know, if your action moves forward today, we'll look to see if we would increase that amount of the pre-funding, taking into account whether we would have any benefit for borrowing the cash, but at least at a minimum on an, an uh, without a haircut, the city would realize some savings by pre-funding um, at least $82 million. And just to clarify too, we only pre-fund the tier one contributions. We don't pre-fund tier two. So, so that, that's, that's what we're looking at in terms of how much savings could we get. So, and Jim might want to add some additional fl flavor to that. Yeah, Please. thanks. Thanks, Julia. Jim, Jim Shannon, the city's budget director. Um, so as, as, as the board knows, we're um, grappling with um, our, our you know, challenges of our own as the city and looking to balance a uh, revenue shortfall expected for this fiscal year. And then again, for 2021, and probably, you know, with the uh, budgetary challenges con continuing into the um, medium term future in the least. And so we're looking at evaluating all the options that may be out there, um, you know, when 
so this this may be an oppor opportunity to for the, the city to take advantage of uh, of some of the unique conditions that we have. We'd still need to do that analysis and and make sure that we felt comfortable as an organization with whatever way we wanted to uh, go. Um, which which also brings up a little bit the question of um, of, of timing because I, I know that the with the board decision I think here is to um, affirm what the discount rate would be um, what, then we would need to quickly take action to understand um, what that um, what that contribution level would change to and Julia's team has to do the uh, analysis to see you know what what sort of uh, borrowing levers that that she would need to employ. But our timing to release the budget is early early May, so we're really up against it here. And so, just wanted to um, maybe have that conversation about uh, when the uh, revised contributions, if we were to prefund, might be made available. And I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Polani, is that a response for you? Um, and, and maybe you can respond to the question. Uh, as Mr. Shannon asked it, and also if it's different from what's been what's occurred in the past. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Chair Castellano. So, uh, so in terms of timing, uh, so of course, if the board approves this today, uh, we have reached out uh, as of I believe this morning uh, to the Police and Fire Investment Committee uh, to hold a special meeting next week uh, to have a similar discussion, and. If the Police and Fire Investment Committee has similar views to the Fed Board, then it makes uh, makes it a little easier in terms of the recommendation, and we can make the recommendation to the city before the end of the month. Um, I do have a, one question, um, and this may or may not be relevant for for the resolution, but since we have Mr. Hallmark here, I believe. Uh, so Mr. Shannon uh, said that, or I guess Ms. Cooper said that they could partially uh, pre-fund. And so in terms of calculating the actuarial equivalence, uh, so typically if it's the full refund, then we can simply take the midpoint as Kion has always done this. Uh, and I explained that methodology to you before we take the square root of you know, one plus the 6.75%. But if they're going to do a partial uh, pre-funding, uh, we'll have to think about whether that means those cash, that's for cash flows towards the, the early part of the year. And accordingly, the actual equivalence would be slightly different. And I don't know if Mr. Hallmark cares to uh, comment on that. Uh, Mr. Hallmark, it's like you're on mute still. Bill, looks like you're still on mute. Oh, there we go. There. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I uh, yeah. If there's a partial payment, we would just need to know uh, what the partial payment is in advance, so that we could calculate the discount on the partial payment and what the remaining contribution rate would be. So um, it, it, it's something that's easily doable, but uh, we would need the information to break out those two components. And would you also need to know the timing on the balance of the uh, contributions? But I assume the timing, well, if there are going to be multiple lump sum payments, then yes, we'd want to know the timing on each of those payments. If we're just splitting to one lump sum payment as of July 1, and then the remainder is being done on a payroll basis. Um, we could set that up. Uh, so just whatever the plan is, we, we would need to know. And then as Prabhu indicated, there's the uh, liquidity concerns and trying to match up uh, the contributions with the benefit payments that I presume he would wanna work through. Well, can I follow up on Bill's comment? This is a trustee sum. So if the city makes a partial um, pre-funding on July 1st, it is fairly easy to spread this partial payment to 26 periods subsequently, right? And using that time weighted, you know, those of you, you, you spread that uh, 
prepay member, for instance, just use Julia as example, 82 million. You spread that 82 billion into 26 pay period, discounted all of these uh, 26 pay payments to July 1 using the required rate of return. That's mathematically very simple. Uh, yeah, I think that's what Bill was saying that, that he could do that. I guess then it is it now a question uh, for Julie and Jim? Do you folks have a plan for how you would like to uh, fund that? I, well, I, I, go ahead, Jim. No, I was just going to say it, it sounds like we have. I mean, without getting too much into the weeds during during the board discussion, it sounds like we probably have the mechanics. We can figure out the mechanics to. Uh, figure out what that revised contribution amount would be, um, you know, prior to the, uh, well, prior, well, as, as soon as uh, before the close of April as possible, but it sounds like between uh, uh, the different options that we've discussed, we'd be able to get that across the goal line, which would be my biggest concern. I, I um, help me if I'm not, uh, if I'm, not with you on this. It seems that uh, Julie and Jim, if you folks have a plan for how you would like to do the pre-funding, we need to get that over to Bill, then Bill can kick back a number that Jim, you could use and uh, wrap up in the May 1 budget, proposed budget. Is that correct? Correct. I, I think Julia's team is going to need to do some uh, analysis on what is possible and then probably have some discussions with um, Chiron to see how that gets modeled out. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Harvey Lederman. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, on, in terms of timing, while the municipal code sets an April 30th date by which the city is to notify uh, the board of its intent uh, whether or not to pre-fund, the, the code also gives us the ability to agree otherwise to when that notice may come in. Um, and so I'll put that on the table as well for the board's consideration. You can stay with the April 30th uh, hard date for notice, or if it accommodates the city and it doesn't disaccommodate the investment team to know um, you could move that by a couple of uh, weeks to accommodate the city's uh, budget timing as well. So that, that's available to the board to adjust that April 30th date if the board wants to do so. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I, I, in my mind, I always think we're backing, it, backing into the May 1 proposed budget that Jim needed to have a number for that purpose. Yeah, and, and as, as soon as we can get one, is um, uh, normally we would have a balanced budget by now, we would be in the production phase. So we are, uh, we're just trying to scramble. So the, the sooner we can come to what that number is, um, the, 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 the better we'll all be. Okay, and so um, can we uh, still take the action uh, that uh, the, the, the two matters uh, that uh, Mr. Polani uh, identified for us today and that still gives um, uh, everybody else the flexibility to follow through later with the calculations and, and to meet uh, Jim's budget needs? Uh, yes, we can, Mr. Chairman. I, I just have one clarification, not to get into the weeds at a yes. board meeting too much, but I think it's important and maybe Bill can set me right here. Uh, so if, if there's partial pre-funding and as Trustee Sun said, if we spread it over 26 months, if we consider this to be a partial pre payment for each of the 26 periods, the, the, the amount that comes will, will, that we work out will be slightly favorable to the city. If we instead consider the partial payment to be near-term payments, as opposed to payments that come later, it'll be a little bit more favorable to the plans. Again, this is nickel and diming this a little bit, but I just wanted to get uh, for my own uh, clarity, um, just wanted to ask Mr. Hallmark if he has any views on that. So I think you're correct, but if you uh, consider it near-term payments, then the city's uh, contributions with each payroll would be lower in the near term, and then they'd have to jump up in, later when that near term runs out, uh, as opposed to just spreading it evenly over the 26 pay periods, then you can also set uh, a fixed city contribution for each pay period going forward. Great, thank you, uh, Bill. 
And so, Mr. Chairman, yes, we can certainly, yeah, uh, unless there are further questions uh, or Mr. Pena has any comments, I think we can go ahead uh, with the resolution. Uh, this is Chen Yu. Can I just add in one thing? Um, actually, probably a disclaimer from both my work standpoint view. Um, I manage the cash flow for the city. So how we are calculating the, 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 the pre-funding savings and how it's going to be impacted the cash flow is very critical for my operation. So that's why I'm advocating for, uh, uh, for even spread to 26 pay period. I think that's a fair way to calculate the city's pre-funding a month. And you know, um, it's not going to shortchange the city in any way um, by just cherry picking any kind of pay periods. I don't think that using applying earlier pay periods uh, only will be a fair calculation. Um, so I just want the, the whole board to take that into consideration. Uh, on this too, Trustee Sun, uh, I think, um, um, you know, I think uh, Bill Hallmark was very clear that it would make sense to spread it over the 26 pay periods. And um, as Prabhu indicated, Chair, uh, yes, I think this is a point where the, the board can, can go ahead and make the motions. We would certainly uh, um, make sure that our office work closely with finance and the budget director so we can get information to Chiron as, as soon as it's available. And then uh, once we get information from Chiron, get it back to the city. So, um, you know, we need to work that out so that it can be accomplished with a reasonable time. And also so that when the, the special meeting for the uh, police and fire IC is scheduled for next week, hopefully by then we have a little more information to uh, to provide them uh, for the decision, but uh, you know that that remains to be seen. But I think uh, at this point, we are ready to move forward with the motion. Um, just unless there are any other comments by by anybody else. Okay. So, um, Mr. Pliny, please work with me on this. I'll, I'll take an initial shot at the motion. You can let me know if it, it uh, is, meets your needs. So the motion would be to uh, continue the practice outlined in the 2014 memo, um, and then to um, uh, utilize the uh, full discount rate for um, uh, the pre-funding for this, uh, at least for this fiscal year. And that will work, uh, Chair Castellano, or you can simply uh, accept the memo uh, written on April 8, 2020 by me, which uh, suggests, which recommend, recommends the same thing. Okay, that's fine. So I, I, I'll, I, can, I can do it that way to uh, accept the memo with the recommendation from Mr. Polani on April 8. Trustee Keller. Uh, I second the motion. Uh, thank you, Trustee Orr. Uh, any further board discussion? I have one question again. Um, if if it weren't for the situation that we're in now with the coronavirus, generally speaking, when would the uh, city notify uh, the team about pre-funding or not? When is that decision generally on a on a calendar cycle? I believe uh, we are normally intimated in the month of uh, March. Um, certainly, Brian, Jay, and Roberta can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, mm -hmm. Although, obviously, Julia is uh, is available, so she probably have uh, or Jim a more specific uh, answer. I think the code allows up to April thirtieth. Yes, but I mean, when do we actually um, get the uh, the um, information from the city? I I don't know if they wait until the absolute mm -hmm. uh, end of the time period, but I, I don't recall it specifically. Uh, it, it is quite possible that we get the official uh, communication closer to the deadline, but we do get some heads up early on whether they are seriously considering 
to uh, Prefon and uh, Julia, did you? Um... Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we engage in conversations with retirement staff between finance and the budget office because it's part of um, the budget office five year forecast process that happens in February. So there's a lot of like internal back and forth staff dialogue um, leading up to that February report. So so generally, like um, Parbu indicated, you know, we had told them, you know, before the COVID-19 virus hit us that we had intended not to do the pre-funding because the haircut was still in place. So, um, and- That's it, perfect. That answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? Uh, I neglected to check earlier. Is, is there any public discussion before we take a vote? All right, let's do, do a roll call vote. Uh, Vice Chair Chandra? Aye. Trustee Horowitz? Aye. Trustee Jennings? Aye. Trustee Kelleher? Aye. Trustee Orr? Aye. And Trustee Sun? Aye. I also vote aye, so that uh, uh, motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, everyone, on that one. Um, we are going to go back to the agenda. Let's see. It's uh, I'm doing a time check. It's 10:46. I uh, my understanding is council member needs to leave by 11:15. So I'm thinking at about 11 o'clock um, change of the agenda to allow for the council members um, liaison uh, update for the board would be good. So um, Laura. The, could you give me a sense about the um, amount of time that we'll take on 3E? Yeah, these, um, these, these reports should be very um, quick. The healthcare, as you know, has a similar uh, manager lineup to the pension, which we already went through, and then the changes on the investment policy statement are minimal. Okay, so you think we can handle those by 11 o'clock? Yes, I do. Okay, all right, let's proceed that way then. So let's go back to item 3E. Great, okay, so I can share my screen again. So, can everyone see this slide? Yes. yes. Okay, so I'm on page 21 of the Healthcare Trust. Um, total assets as of the end of December were 318 million. Um, the current allocation at the time was very close to policy. Um, the total return for the fourth quarter of 2019 was 5.7%. Um, for the full year was 15.2%. Um, that's got to be um, very highly ranked in the health and welfare fund universe for funds 250 million to 1 billion. If you recall, your, um, your health fund, your 115 trust, is allocated um, and trying to reach an assumed rate of return similar to your pension. Many other um, uh, institutions have a lower expected return for their health fund and therefore have a much more conservative asset allocation. So in a year like 2019, where equities were up so much, um, this fund uh, outperformed the, uh, the median for other healthcare funds. And if you look um, really across um, the past three years, the fund has outperformed um, other peer funds um, quite a bit. Um, I won't go spend time on the individual manager lineup, mainly because you have just a selection of the same managers that you have um, in the pension, just um, keeping to a, keeping to a, um, a liquid um, sort of uh, a tact. So I don't have anything else to mention on the healthcare trust unless there are questions. Any questions by um, board members? Questions by the public? Okay, I think we're ready to move on to 3F, thank you. Okay, so for 3F, we worked with staff um, to bring back the investment policy statement with a few changes. Um, a couple of these are sort of um, procedural, just it hasn't been updated in um, a little while. And so one of the edits you'll see is that we used to call one of the asset classes, we, as you know, we have growth, we had zero beta, and then we have other as sort of broad functional asset classes for um, the pension. 
Um, we did rename last year zero beta to low beta since it's very difficult to truly capture zero beta to markets. Um, so that's just sort of a procedural change that you'll see. Um, we also on page six, you can see here, we outline each individual asset class that the pension can invest in. Um, and there were a couple of new asset classes added with your most recent asset allocation study. If you recall, you now have the ability to invest in high yield bonds. So we added um, what the purpose is for that asset class and that it falls within the growth bucket. Um, and then we also added long-term government bonds um, in the other allocation. And you can see the purpose of those assets as well. Um, we did remove the dedicated short-term investment grade bonds asset class in the asset allocation. That doesn't mean that you can't invest in short-term investment grade bonds anymore, um, but it does mean that um, they're now captured within think core bonds. The other uh, change that I'll point out is in terms of the rebalancing language. So um, as you know, the board recently directed the staff um, led by the CIO to rebalance the portfolio. Um, and so we wanted to, um, to note that um, unless directed otherwise, the CIO and his team will rebalance to a newly adopted asset allocation by the board as expeditiously as possible. Um, and that there is some dis discretion involved in that rebalancing in the event that a quick liquidation of a manager would not be um, beneficial to the plan. Um, it also notes that the CIO will keep um, the IC apprised of progress towards the new strategic asset allocation, um, therefore the board as well. Um, and then the last thing that I'll point out here is that we updated the target asset allocation to reflect what the board recently adopted in the appendix. So you can see the new numerical allocations. Um, in some cases, like with the addition of high yield bonds, we needed to add a benchmark. Um, with investment grade bonds, we've added a custom benchmark based on the um, fixed income positioning that Mr. Kwan outlined earlier. So that sums up um, the redlined edits to the investment policy statement. And I know that we and your staff are happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much. Are there questions uh, from the board? Uh, I have a question, uh, Chairman Castillo. Yes. Uh, uh, I, I'm ultimately, I think I'm comfortable with the language uh, for um, tactically uh, achieving a rebalancing under a new SAA. But I'm just curious what, uh, how other people write their policies. The word expeditiously is somewhat general and vague. Um, I, I mean, I trust uh, the CIO and his staff, and I know that we have a very good relationship both at the board levels and at the investment committee levels, um, but there will be future CIOs and staffs and new boards. And so just a little bit of understanding and clarity around that would be helpful just from a governance perspective. Yeah, I can speak to what we see from, from other large institutional pension funds. Um, this language, really even the existing rebalancing language that was already here is more detailed than you typically see. Um, typically, it's something along the lines of, you know, um, staff will rebalance um, according to the board's preference or some, something very, very general. Um, so the fact that, that you do have this language, I think, is a natural risk control. The fact that it is more detailed than, than most of your peers. Um, uh, you know, so, so even outlining how a rebalance will take place is, um, is more detailed than you typically see. Um, you know, it's very difficult to put a specific timeline um, in here, such as will be rebalanced, you know, within two weeks or three months or whatever, because you do have so many private markets asset classes and so many individual managers that have um, a wide variety of liquidity provisions. So even a manager that might say that they're daily or monthly or quarterly liquid might still have a notice period of 30 or 60 or 90 days or something like that. And so it's, it's very difficult to put a set um, time limit in here. So, you know, my advice would be um, to just whenever there's a major rebalance taking place, as you have in the past, to make sure that there is some direction to staff around whether or not you want it to happen as soon as possible or in tranches. And that's sort of what we tried to, um, to include with the or in tranches if directed by the board. Um, 
Uh, so, you know, I think that the best way to to control risk there is to, you know, have that be part of the direction as it has been with you in the past. Okay, that's that's helpful. I mean, and, and that sounds right and satisfactory to me. I just thought it's important to ask the question, just get the comps to how peer institutions may handle similar situations. And if if we, if you don't mind, just to belabor it a little bit, I wouldn't mind just getting um, Council Lederman's quick thoughts on this too. Is Harvey there? Yeah, excuse me. I've been cut off and back on a couple of times. Uh, I'm comfortable with this language. Um, I, I think it recognizes the reality of, of as uh, Ms. Weirich explained, um, and, and, and you know, even if you didn't have this language, uh, that would be the, frankly, the practical effect of the decision making anyway, I believe. I think so long as there is uh, open reporting uh, to the investment committee, as required um, and the investment committee is meeting on a regular basis that that this language um, reflects the reality of a situation when you're making changes to the strategic asset allocation so i'm i'm very comfortable with it and, and it and it's 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 in line with other peer systems that i'm familiar with okay super thank you to both of you no more questions for me chair castellano Thank you. Hey, Chair. Uh, this is a trustee sound. I have a, yes. a general comment. Um, since I have uh, participated uh, in a few investment committee meetings, uh, my, uh, I learned that um, procedure-wise, the investment staff has uh, no uh, authority to do any tactical uh, allocation on the portfolio. Um, however, the investment policy provides, um, offers a provision for any uh, a bandwidth of 10% um, of the target allocation. I want to just uh, throw out a, a proposal there that we, so that the CIO and the investment can step, staff can uh, you know, allocate this uh, portfolio within the band bandwidth of a target weight as they see, as they see fit. And I do not see there's any necessity for the CIO to come to the board or investment committee prior for him to move the asset weight within the benefits. We had a couple of discussion earlier we have on a special IC meeting. But in general, I just find it there was not much of a point because even though the the weight the the weight of the, the propo proposed weight for the asset class might be a little bit above the target, but it's still within the policy that list. I think that's within the uh, CIO's uh, uh, scope of responsibility to do so. Uh, so, Chair Castellano, this is the uh, CIO. Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, is just trustee Sun suggesting a change in either the practice or the language? Uh, no, I, I tried to search a language. I don't think the language of the policy prohibits you to uh, to allocate the, the asset within the bandwidth of the uh, the tar within the bandwidth of that target. So what I'm just saying procedure wise, I do see, do not see any need for you to come to the committee or board, ask permission. Let's just say, if you have 49% um, of allocation on equity, um, public equity, if you want to move to 52%, I think you have a perfect right. I don't think you need really coming to the committee or board, ask perm permission. As long as you reported to us what you did afterwards, that's fine or timely. I think that's fine. That's my take on that. I think right. as a CIO, you should have a strategic view. For, you should have your market view and a strategic plan for the for the portfolio. You should be allowed to move in the bandwidth of any target weight as a, a, a target asset weight. Thank you for your comments, Trustee Sun, and that's duly noted. Uh, so the reason to do this uh, is is actually quite simple. So. We made a decision uh, 
when I took over as CIO, that we will not do any tactical waiting uh, and that we will stick to strategic asset allocation. And, and that's because I felt that we did not necessarily have the expertise in-house to engage in tactical asset allocation. And besides that, uh, tactical asset allocation also has other issues in terms of tracking performance measurement and so on and so forth. And so the reason we wrote that 10% bandwidth into the policy is simply to give us some flexibility and not have to frequently rebalance and cost the plan any unnecessary transactions costs. And now when the, when the meltdown in the market began, and that was an exception, and, and so I wanted to communicate in the, in the interest of open communication to all IC members. And because I wanted this to be consultative and collaborative, I requested those special IC meetings, and which is why we had those meetings to discuss uh, the overweighting. And so I'm, 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 this is a once in a decade event, and hopefully, you know, uh, hopefully the next black swan won't happen for another 10 years. But that's the reason why uh, we came in front of the IC. But thank you, and your comments are duly noted. Thank you, Mr. Polani. Other, um, any other questions before we uh, go towards the motion? No, I'm, I'm finished. Okay, thank you. So on this one, we need a motion to accept the updates to the investment policy as presented by Makita. Yeah, I'll make that motion. I'll make a motion to approve the amendments and edits to the investment policy. Okay, good. Motion by Trustee Anuag. Thank you very much. And I second that. Second by Trustee Horowitz. <clears throat> Any other board discussion? Any other public discussion? All right, uh, roll call vote, please. Uh, Vice Chair Anuag. Aye. Sandra. Trustee Horowitz. Aye. Trustee Jennings. Aye. Trustee Kelleher. Aye. Trustee Orr. Aye. Trustee Sun. Aye. I also vote aye. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, everyone, on that. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, for, for that presentation, too. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chair, members of the board and staff. OK. Um, so it's 11.02. Um, I'd like to uh, try and catch uh, Council Member Davis before she needs to leave. So let's move on to item 4B. Oral update from the city council liaison to the board. Good morning, council member. Good morning. Thank you, chair. Um, I did want to do an update today. I think the all the members of the federated board who are city employees already know this stuff, but I do want to make sure that the whole board is aware of um, kind of what's going on. We get a COVID update every Tuesday with our council meeting, and um, just as it relates to the budget. We are, the last estimate we got was um, that we would be down in this current fiscal year by $45 million in revenue and that we will come back, staff will be coming back to us at the end of April to address um, the current fiscal year cost reductions that are going to be necessary. They're also, they were projecting um, a $65 million deficit for the following the upcoming fiscal year. Um, and as, as Jim kind of alluded, he's working on that budget right now. What our city manager told us this Tuesday was that um, the proposed budget is going to come to us in early May and it's gonna have um, a couple of different times when we will be looking at reductions. So there will be immediate reductions starting at you know the beginning of the fiscal year on July 1st. And then we'll come back depending on how the situation changes um, in August or September if we need to do additional reductions to keep the budget balanced. You all know we have to have a balanced budget every year. So that's what's going on on the, on the budget side and the revenue that normally comes in. And then I also wanna talk a little bit and make sure that the board is aware that we've got our intergovernmental relations team also working at both the state and the federal levels with our local delegations to make sure as much as possible that we can get um, some lost revenues covered for um, by any kind of CARES Act uh, stimulus that comes out again. So they're working on 
uh, at least one more, but probably two or even three more CARES Act okay. um, relief packages. Yeah, and okay. so we're so hoping we're doing, some lost, uh, yeah. lost yeah, revenue. I was really scared of when they when the, yeah. when the CIO was popping up out of the. So that is, um, that's my update. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. I did wanna, well, actually there's one more thing. So one thing that we hear every week is what our immediate imperatives are. And they are, they're calling them, the, the Emergency Operations Center, they're calling them the three challenges of now. So imperative one is of course to save lives. Imperative two is to save livelihoods. And then imperative three is to preserve our city's fiscal health. So I just want you to know that our emergency operations team is working on first saving lives, secondly, saving livelihoods, and then third, preserving our city's fiscal health. But all of those things are, are on our radar. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, council member. Any questions for the council member before she, before she needs to leave? Thank you. Okay, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I, um, I need to go back to um, item 3G, the pre-funding uh, matter. Um, so, uh, council, if you could help me on this. As you recall, we, the, we took a motion to accept the um memo <clears throat> the recommendation uh, and the memo that was in the memo um from mr Polani dated april 8. um I, I it appears i needed we need to capture a second motion uh to extend the city's notice date from april 30th to to an, uh, an x date per the municipal code section 3.36.1590 c so a uh, council could you help me with that Sure, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Harvey Lederman, Reed Smith. Um, uh, forgive me, uh, at that critical time when the motion was being made on this item, uh, my internet connection uh, got broken or, and, and I had a difficult time getting back. And when I finally got back, uh, the, uh, we had moved on to the next item. Uh, we had had a discussion uh, in item 3G about timing in terms of the city giving notice. I made a point uh, during that discussion to say that the board could move that date from April 30th to another date if it wanted to accommodate uh, the city's uh, budget timetable. It's not imperative that we do so, but if we're not, if we're going to change the April 30th notice date that the city uh, must give us the notice by, uh, we actually have to do that by uh, board action. Uh, so uh, with your uh, indulgence, now would be the time if the board wanted to move that date from April 30th to a later date, um, uh, a motion to do that should be introduced. This is all laid out in municipal code, uh, section 3.361590, C as in Charlie. Uh, so I, I, that's the only reason for bringing this back up. If, if that was the board's intention or not, it needs to be done by a duly made motion, second and a vote. Okay. Um, and uh, Mr. Plani, is that what we do need to do in order to make this workable? Um, I'm not sure that Roberta can uh, perhaps help me out here. Uh, does the city need extra time uh, over and uh, beyond April 30th? I think Mr. Pena was uh, talking to someone when I asked him the question. So, uh, Roberta, does the city need time beyond April 30th? I, you know, I, I don't know if they do or don't, but it doesn't hurt to move the day to at least May 15 or so. It doesn't hurt anything. Um, you know, so I, I think council's uh, input is, is appropriate. Uh, we can still go ahead with the, with the work and the pre-funding anyway, but I think just to be clear, it may be better if we extend it. Um, this is Trustee Jennings, can I say something? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, my understanding is they pushed out the, um, uh, when the proposed budget will go out. So rather, 
publishing it at the beginning of May. I think they pushed it out a week. So Jim has a little bit more time. It just seems like there's a little bit that has to go back and forth. Julia has to come up with it. Uh, Trevor, you know, they have to come up with their piece. I think pushing it out to May 15th is probably a good idea just to give them that extra wiggle room if they need it. Okay. Trustee Jennings, would you care to make the motion? Yes, I'll make the motion to push it out to uh, May 15th. Okay. I'll second the motion. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, who seconded that? Uh, Trustee Kelleher seconds the motion. Thank you very much. So that, that motion is to extend the city's uh, notice date to from April 30th to May 15th uh, per, the, um, per the municipal code. Um, any, uh, any other board discussion on that? Any public discussion? Okay, a roll call vote, please. Vice Chair Chandra. Aye. Trustee Horowitz? Aye. Trustee Jennings? Aye. Trustee Kelleher? Aye. Trustee Orr? Aye. And Trustee Sun? Trustee Sun? Aye, sorry, I was on mute. Okay, and I also uh, eye on that. So that motion, again, made by Trustee Jennings, seconded by Trustee Geller, carries unanimously. Thank you very much, uh, Council and everybody else for um, going back on that one. Uh, next, uh, item 4A, oral update from the CEO of Retirement Services, Mr. Pena. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So if you bear with me, just give me a couple of minutes. Um, just wanted to let you know, we keep providing uh, customer service at the office uh, a little different than, than in the past. Uh, it's either through phone calls or uh, through online or by processing the mail. Uh, in terms of the mail, um, I actually wanted to, um, I, I was, uh, uh, there's another item I'm gonna present uh, where um, I'm gonna mention, I, I was at the city council meeting this past Tuesday and the city manager gave some shout out to some uh, some employees uh, throughout the city, including retirement. And uh, in retirement, uh, our staff is Teresa. Teresa is uh, in the benefit section, and she is, I believe, uh, the person that lives closer to the office. And she has taken upon herself, and also with the help of Catherine Schaefer, the benefits manager, to. Uh, uh, go by the office more often and making sure that uh, we can process uh, mail that security can function because still through mail we are receiving uh, retirement applications we are receiving medical medicare part d forms we are uh, getting forms for either uh, address changes or tax exchanges and we also get forms uh, that we need to continue processing when the members get married or there is a death or there is a birth of a child. So that's a critical function. So along with the shout out that uh, the city manager gave our office and Teresa, uh, uh, specifically, I wanted to do the same here. So business as usual, we continue processing vendor invoices and, uh, and applications. And, and uh, we send out the 415 notifications timely as well as the deferred best and everything else. So uh, it, it's been uh, a bit of a challenge, as you all know. And as you know, you're having this uh, board meeting uh, today through Zoom uh, because of the work by the administrative staff and IT and Barbara Heyman. So thank you as well to everyone involved in, in this process. I also wanted to uh, let you know that at the city council meeting last Tuesday, the council approved a memo uh, issued by Jennifer Schoenbrink, which is the director of uh, HR, Human Resources, and OER, requesting a change to the city agreement uh, with CalPERS, or the Defined Benefit Plan, to allow for the inclusion of uh, those investment professionals uh, that are currently on Tier 3 and a future CEO. And so uh, that took place on Tuesday and it was approved by the city council. 
there's still some administrative uh, stuff to be completed between the city and coffers, but I expect the, the process to take place in the next 60 days so that we can get our investment professionals uh, uh, within the CalPERS defined benefit plan. So thank you everyone for the work uh, from the engagement and the work from the trustees of the boards to the work by the city administration. I also wanted to let you know that at the meeting of the city council last Tuesday, I presented the actual evaluation results as of 6-30-2019. As you know, this morning, you had a long discussion on pre-funding. Just to give you some perspective, the city was uh, uh, speaking about pre-funding about $82 million. The total amount due prior to the pre-funding uh, calculation was about $443 million. Obviously, the city pre-fund, there's gonna be some savings, so that amount is gonna be a bit lower. But all in all, 82 million is about 20% of the total amount due. It was a bit awkward to present to the city council that information in the middle of a meeting, as Council Member Davis indicated, where there's a lot of COVID-19 pandemic information and uh, the city dealing with revenue shortfalls and, uh, and all the kind of services that they need to look into it. But nevertheless, I think it went well. I did remind, on, wanted to let, uh, I did let the city council know, I wanted to let you board know, we are working with Chiron. Uh, the goal is to bring Chiron before you, whether it's in person or it's through Zoom for your Zoom meeting. Um, and the concept is to uh, hopefully, now that we have new data with the results of the, of the market downturn, and hopefully we'll know more by June, so that we can work on new three to five year scenarios and, uh, and possibly some policy changes uh, on the one hand to mitigate uh, the impact of this macro downturn, uh, but, by this, you know, uh, but by the same token also making sure that we continue and keep the health of both plans for the long haul. And lastly, um, I wanted, this morning, um, consent. Uh, hopefully, you get a chance to see the the second newsletter for the month of April. The newsletter went out by mail last week. I think by now most, if not all, members should have received it. And I wanted to give a shout out to staff involved. Obviously, uh, Linda and Barbara are both intimately involved in, in in getting the newsletter completed, and also Prabhu. Uh, on you know, you saw that Prabhu was the feature. Uh, staff on this uh, this newsletter, we gave him fifty percent of the uh, uh, of the real estate uh, by providing an, an update on, on the market situation and also introducing him to the membership. And uh, and lastly, um, I think I I, I have kept all, both boards surprised on the, on the impact of the revenue shortfall to the city by providing you copies of the city memo on that issue. But I also wanted to let you know, we issued an information memo to the city council last week. Uh, it was uh, prepared by uh, CIO Polani just to inform the city uh, council the changes that took place in both of the plans as allocations and the decisions that were made by the boards uh, at their respective meetings uh, last month. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, that concludes my uh, comments and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pena. I also want to thank the staff for continuing to provide this, the great level of service they do to the retirees uh, in, in using a very different mode, as, uh, same, similarly uh, supporting the uh, board meeting uh, through Zoom. I know it's been, uh, it, 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 it seems there's a big challenge because uh, everything is a bit different. So thank you all for doing that. And also, um, I am also thankful that um, the investment staff uh, now gets a um, defined benefit uh, retirement plan too. Any other questions for um, Mr. Pena, Trustee Jennings? Um can you just explain a little more what the tier three calpers what that is about i it just i didn't gather what yeah was. no i apologize to jennings uh you're, you're correct uh, so tier three uh is is the tier within the city that just provide a defined contribution 
So when you join the city at a, as a management employee, you have the, the option of either joining the, the, the federated system or joining tier three. Uh, investment staff by resolution of, uh, of 2014, uh, when the, the um, council helped me out here, what was the, what was passed by the city? I forgot the, the measure. Uh, measure G. Measure, measure G was G. passed by the city that provided the boards the right uh, or the responsibility of hiring and firing their CIO and CEO. That measure G also uh, eliminated the option of future investment professionals uh, from that point forward, sometime in 2014, November or December, to join the federative. Uh, benefit uh, plan and only join the tier three um, defined contribution similar to a 457 is actually uh, on the IRS code is known as 401A, but it's just a defined contribution. By the city uh, approving the change in their agreement with CalPERS, as you know, uh, when I refer to the city, I, I'm speaking mostly about the city council members. City council members get the defined benefit plan through CalPERS. So that's the agreement that I'm referring to. And that agreement that the city has on the benefit with CalPERS for the city council members um, was approved to be amended to now add to that list the investment professionals that became uh, members uh, of the office after that particular day for Metro G and a future CEO uh, when, uh, you know, obviously after I'm gone and a new CEO is hired, they will have the right also to be on the developer's benefit. So that's what I was referring to. So is that all that you need to know? Or is it just the CEOs? It is, it, is, it is just the members for the office retirement services. It's only allowing to add the investment professionals, which is really the CIO, senior investment officer, investment officer, and investment analyst. Just those members. And um, it precedes me, so it doesn't include me, but it includes my position, so any future CEO will also be included. Those are the only members, not the other uh, Unit 99, because the other Unit 99 members across the city, when they join the city, they have the choice to either join Tier 3 or join our federated retirement plan. I see. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Any other follow-up on uh, 4B? Uh, Roberto, uh, in your comments, I, I, did you say that you had included in our packet the memo from the city manager on the uh, fiscal situation? Yeah, I, you know, as you know, chair, sometimes I reach out just to the chairs and vice chairs of both boards, and other times I reach out to the full boards. I was under the impression that last Saturday I actually send out an email to both boards and our vendors to provide you some background on the city budget situation by including that memo. So that's yeah. what I was referring to. If I, if I did not, I apologize, but I thought I did. I, I know I saw it. I don't, and I don't, I don't think it's in the packet, but I don't recall where, from where I did see that. So um, yeah, it's not it's not in this packet for this board meeting, but I sent it out by email last Saturday, I believe. Yeah, okay. And that's what um, I was referring to. Yeah, and, and if anyone doesn't have that, then perhaps they can con contact uh, Please. Roberto directly. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's just so uh, a point of reference, that memo actually uh, uh, speaks to the two numbers that Councilmember Davis just spoke about, about the $45 million shortfall for the current fiscal year, for the city ending on June 30th, 2020, as well as a $65 million shortfall estimated at this time for the upcoming 2020-2021 uh, fiscal year. Yes, yes. Okay. All right, very good. So let's move on then to uh, also under new business item 4C, discussion and action on the Office of Driver Services proposed administrative budget for fiscal year 2021. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I will speak to it. And uh, as I go through the slides, staff, I believe, is going to be directing the slides so you can all um, be apprised of the specific information I'm referring to. But before I kick off the discussion, I wanted to share something with uh, the full board. As, as, as that memo that, that we just spoke about on the, um, the city budget revenue shortfalls and the impact, and the statements by Councilmember uh, uh, Davis, um, I, I participate uh, from other senior staff across the city in their meetings. And you should know that the city um, manager has through also the budget director has provided directors across the city with a specific request to decrease their budget, uh, the, the specific department budgets. And I believe, I don't, I don't have that memo because I'm not a department head that reports to the city manager. Uh, so I don't know the specifics, but there are some specific numbers where they were requesting some decrease, whether it's five, 10% in different areas or whether it included personnel, so on and so forth. The way the city usually works is the city manager issued those uh, memos to the department heads that reports to him or her. And then through the mayor's office, which our office, retirement services, we have a contact person. Through the mayor's office, the mayor's office issue a similar memo to what they call the appointees. And the appointees are the city attorney's office, the, the city clerk's office, uh, the city auditor's office, uh, and the office of retirement services. The reason I'm letting you know that is because what you have here before you this morning is the original budget request that we put forward when I, I met with the senior staff uh, to put forward the request and I also had discussions with our contact person at the mayor's office. Um, we have not received, I have not received any memos from the mayor's office uh, for the appointees on any request. And the reason I'm letting you know that is so that you realize that um, obviously we are part of the city process and as the city is going to go through this uh, painful situation, I think it will be appropriate for our office to keep that in mind and if, to the extent possible, if we can participate on providing some flexibility while at the same time making sure that we accomplish accomplish our goals for the year that we should consider doing that. But at this point, I have not received any direction. So I will go ahead with the presentation that was originally uh, put together. And if I do receive in the future any information, I will first reach out to both board chairs and vice chairs and then find a way to bring back any possible changes to the budget request. Does that make sense? Yes. Very well. So Linda, or is it Linda or Barbara, if you can um, open up the uh, presentation. So that's the memo. Um, I'm just waiting. Uh, All right, thank you. So if we go to a uh, slide. <laughs> if I can share the content, I can move it uh, from here, from my iPad, but uh, I leave it up to you, Barbara or Linda, how you want to handle it. Okay, there you go. So if we go to, um, I'm just gonna skip to slide uh, directly, slide uh, 
seven. The, the slides through to six, it just gives you a background on how we put the budget together and I speak to the sources and uses of funds, which is also explained in the memo. So let me just skip right to the, the budget matter. Uh, the total amount that we are requesting is about $5.7 million. As you can see, the bulk of this budget, about 63% is personnel services, uh, which as you can see here, the proposed amount is 3.55, million. Um, please keep in mind, we always have on the right-hand side, two columns, one where we are comparing the difference between the proposed versus what the board adopted last year. And then the next one, uh, the proposed vis-a-vis -vis the actual amount that we are forecasting to spend through the end of the fiscal year. So this particular personal services will have all the slides further down the presentation, but in a nutshell, we have a total of 39.75 positions that are approved uh, for the office and we are remaining at that level because um, on the one hand we will be requesting uh, a senior investment officer position but also we deleted uh, an information system analyst limited day position we deleted that for this year so we remain at the same level uh, for non-personnel equipment uh, one million two hundred forty six thousand and uh, you can see that's a decrease from last year adopted budget, but an increase from the actual. And so we'll go through the specifics, but uh, just like in personal services, the difference between the proposed and the actual is we have had vacancies throughout the year. So that, that number there of 11.41, it reflects those vacancies because the proposed amount always assumed that we are fully staffed for the full year. For non-personal equipment, uh, that's a combination of things. We try to be as efficient as possible, but by the same token, uh, there are some issues or items that we may not be able to implement throughout the year. I can tell you specifically on, on that amount, one of the differences is that we had intended, we were able to implement the newsletter communication this year, uh, but we also had anticipated implementing a social media communication. Uh, that's not gonna happen this fiscal year. In fact, uh, you're going to have a presentation at your next meeting in May from our communication consultant on a strategic planning for social media to be rolled out for the new fiscal year. So in situations where we had anticipated kicking something off sooner and we were not able to, that's where you see the difference between the proposed and the actual. On professional services, same situation. I think the biggest uh, number there is that um, we usually on the proposed amount uh, take in consideration the actual expenses and average for the prior uh, couple of years. And in this particular situation, I think the one area that we have tried very hard to keep lower is really legal services. So I think the bulk of that difference there is, uh, is, uh, um, is legal services that we were able to keep them lower than anticipated. And then the last one, um, we have a lot of flexibility on the medical services. It, it is the smallest portion of your budget. It accounts for about 2.4% of the total budget. Uh, but the reason uh, for the big difference is we have, um, we adopted uh, 137 uh, this year, and we are proposing the same for the following year. And the reason for that is or about the same is we have a number of applications that we seek to complete throughout the year. And so we were not able to do that for the current year. We actually were not able to complete as many disability applications as anticipated, but we're gonna try again for the upcoming year to increase that amount. So we do have some applications on the pipeline. And if, if there's a situation where the city will come back and request uh, some savings, I think that's one area that we can actually use to decrease uh, the total administrative, administrative request. But with that said, if we can go to the, uh, to the next slide, please. 
So this, this slide is specifically explaining the personnel services. Again, the total figure is $3.56 million. Um, I do want to let you know a couple of things. This number is number one based on the total positions approved for the office. And some of the new trustees may be wondering why 39.75 is because we have one position that, that the employee actually only works 75% uh, of the time. So that's why, otherwise it will be 40. And, um, and so of course, uh, we do have a full-time employee allocated to each plan. So that, that's where the 19.875 uh, comes from. Um, I do wanna mention something. Um, we do not keep track of, of the work by every staff in the office that they do throughout the year to determine whether they do more work for federated or they do more work for police and fire. So in terms of allocating the cost, that's based on a 50, 50%, except for the investment staff. For the investment staff, a few years back, we agreed to split that uh, at the same ratio of total assets. So that comes out to about we charge 60% of the cost to police and fire because they had about 60% of the total assets and 40% uh, to federate it. Um, but aside from that, uh, the main issue here is that that includes a regular cost of living increases paid to employees. And in the situation where there are annual reviews, it also accounts for potential uh, annual review increases. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, the bottom line here is we ask him, we add in a senior investment officer position, but because we deleted an investment system analyst limited day, the total authorized positions remain the same. Uh, we are also looking to add and delete uh, a disability, a staff specialist uh, position to a disability analyst position. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So here, uh, this is just the org chart for the office and the goal here is just to, um, in the chart, just to show where are the, uh, the 39.75 positions. Uh, and you can see um, this, uh, right now we have a vacancy for a senior analyst position. And, uh, and you can see uh, the areas on the left hand side where we have the senior retirement investment officer position. And on the, the benefit side, which is towards the middle, towards the bottom, you see the staff specialist, which is vacant to be, um, to be add and delete to uh, an analyst position. If we can go to the next slide. Oh, by the way, as I go through the presentation, if you have any questions, please stop me and let me know. So this is the specifics on the non-personnel equipment analysis. The, uh, Non-personal equipment decreased from the prior year, uh, but the main reason for that is, I don't want you to misread what is in here. Investment analytics and research budget was reduced by 131,000 for the state three services for performance analytics. That not, does not mean that we did not incur the cost. It's just that, um, Investment expenses usually are not really part of the administrative budget. That's why in this budget, you do not see the manager fees for the year. Uh, and so to be consistent and to be in alignment with the CAFR, which stands for Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, we finally took that cost out of the administrative budget but it does not mean that it was not incurred. It's just, it is a cost that is accounted for, it's part of the CAFR and the accounting for the year, but it's not part of the administrative budget. There's also the annual maintenance fee for LRS, which is the vendor that we procured to uh, uh, implement the new section or the new version V3 of the administrative system. That annual maintenance was reduced by 62,000. Uh, on the upside, we did increase IT by 26,000 uh, for the plan projects. Again, the social media for the coming year. And we are also looking to uh, options to improve our phone capabilities in the office. So if we can go to the next slide. 
Um, here, this is just a, a very detailed explanation of what makes that 1,246,000. You can see that the bulk of this proposed budget is investment data processing or maybe no sort of environment and so on and so forth that is used uh, by the investment staff. Uh, I can tell you that uh, for consistency purposes, we have selected to keep these amounts here in the proposed budget. But again, if we were strictly following the definition of the administrative uh, budget on the California code, we have the, the, the possibility, we have the ability to take the full amount of 435,000 because they are specifically investment related and investment expenses are supposed to be taken completely uh, directly from the plan and uh, to, to be the result of the net rate of, uh, rate of return. Uh, but because we have kept those expenses over the years, we kept it this year. We are gonna have to decide for the fiscal year 21, 22, whether we're gonna continue including those expenses or not. So just a heads up for next year in the event that you see a big drop off. And the rest of the expenses, of course, um, there's an item in your board later today meeting uh, uh, asking your board to approve a new five-year lease. That is the, the rent cost for uh, our location. Uh, there's also an item on approving fiduciary and commercial liability insurance. Uh, so that's the cost and so on and so forth. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, so professional services, uh, we'll have a slide behind this one just to uh, speak specifically about what is comprised of that total figure. Uh, but in a nutshell, again, uh, this, uh, this professional service analysis really includes a number of, of the work provided by our professionals, but the legal, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the, the main cause associated here is legal expenses. Uh, of the of different variations, right? We have legal expenses from general counsel and fiduciary counsel, but we also have tax counsel. We also have counsel for the benefit staff that deals with uh, domestic relations orders and also with the disability applications. Uh, included there as well is the cost associated for the actuary, and, uh, and so that's included there. Um, Please, I do want to caution everyone that as is indicated in this uh, slide, the cost associated with the new pension administration system is not included in the budget as those costs are capitalized, right? So the total cost of that pension administration system is close to $9 million. Roberta, so if we go, yes. I have a question. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, so you have a capital budget? Uh, no. No, we don't have the capital budget that we present to the board. We don't have that many of those projects. Um, the, 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 again, the main one being the pension administration system that was approved some five, six years ago. You say it's being capitalized though. So how's it being capitalized if you don't have to? Meaning, um, so uh, let me just, uh, meaning from an accounting standpoint. So that we account for the total cost of the plan and then we start taking uh, uh, amortization uh, or depreciation uh, through the accounting process. Benji, are you connected to the agenda? Yes, I am. Can you, uh, can you expand on my comment on the question by Trustee Jennings? Sure, um, like you said, we do not um, have a capital budget but we are not including the pension administration system as part of our administrative budget because we are capitalizing it. Um, the budget amount for this was approved, like Roberto said, about five or six years ago, but we are not actually like keeping a capital budget separate. Um, but uh, in the quarterly um, reports that we sent, uh, that we post, it is included in there, so it will be probably coming out next month. You'll see what the um, capital budget is, how much we've ex expensed, and also what the amortization is. All right, I'm sorry, I'm still a little confused. Um, so does this show in 
Office of Retirement Services on the balance sheet or something like that? Or is this being held by the CMO's office? No, it is in, on our balance sheet. If you take a look at our CAPR, it will be shown there as um, capital assets. I see. Okay. Thank you, Benji. Um, any other questions, Trustee Jennings? Um, I did just have one other question. It was back on the staffing, but um, you don't have to go back to the slide. So you have a vacant position, it seems like. You're doing some ad deletes that I assume you put in the proposed budget to do these ads? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, does, I mean, your positions are City of San Jose positions, right? Yes. And so if there's bumping that goes on within the city as, at large, can they bump into Office of Retirement Services? If for yes, for most of the positions, that is correct. Uh, except for the investment professionals, including the CIO and the CEO. Yes. Right, right. Well, you wouldn't have bumping then because you're. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was just curious. All right. Okay, all right, very well. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, again, as I indicated, this is just the detail of what makes the 752,000. As I indicated, the bulk is legal services and actuarial services. Uh, and then we have the audit um, and we do have other uh, professional services included here. For example, you'll see communication consultant, the work that is produced by Cortex, they are on their other professional services. If we can go to the next, uh, so the last, uh, what we call the last, uh, the fourth bucket or the four main buckets for the uh, presentation of our budget is medical services. And this is strictly related to the work associated with the retirement applications uh, for federated employees. As I indicated, uh, we do have uh, applications uh, in the pipeline. Uh, and so this proposed amount is a goal to complete so many retirement applications throughout the year. Uh, but again, sometimes issues will come up. And I suspect, I, mean, I can tell you for a fact, that the uh, number of applications that we were hoping to complete for the year ending just now in June 30th is gonna be lower um, uh, for many reasons, but the most recent one is the COVID-19. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, prior meetings that we have elected not to continue with the disability uh, um, committee meetings uh, unless there is a financial hardship. So if there is a financial hardship in a situation where an employee needs the, the decision by the board so that they can start receiving benefits, then we will try to bring that, uh, that application forward. But short of that, we are waiting to um, hopefully get back to business as usual. Of course, if business as usual doesn't go back for the next three or four months, then we're gonna have to uh, rethink what we're thinking and maybe somehow start dealing with uh, the retirement applications. It just makes it a little more challenging because there's a lot more people involved in that process. But nevertheless, question. yes. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, are you. This just doesn't seem like a lot of money. Is this for your staff alone? No, this is just uh, the, the amount that you see there, as you can see here, is twofold. We pay, we have a medical advisor. You remember, I don't know if you have met Dr. Chiman. She is a doctor that is hired, has a contract with the board, and she provides medical advice on the disability applications. She wow. works for the board, that's one. And then, of course, when we send uh, uh, members to uh, IMEs or uh, QMEs, then we, that that's also has a cost when those doctors have to review them. And so uh, the 139,000 is mostly the cost associated with, uh, with those examinations or so that work by our medical advisor. And that's like for retiree disability, you know, type stuff or retiree well, workers' so, comp. I mean, you don't, you're not responsible for workers' comp. No, no, that, this is just for retirement applications for the disability, for retiring for disability, from the 
federal plan. Workers come, that's a separate issue through the city. That's not yeah, here, yeah. That's, that's not part of this. Okay, all right, okay? I understand. So again, uh, just wanted to read, uh, this is based on an estimate having two cases per month uh, for the medical advisors and 12 cases annually for older e I, I, I refer to as IME, but independent medical examiners. Again, this is the area where we may have some flexibility in the event that we get some requests uh, to uh, obtain the the, the administrative budget to some extent or some percentage, this may be, may be an area that we have some flexibility. So we can go to the uh, uh, next slide. Um, so that actually completes the, the presentation of the request. The last uh, couple of uh, slides uh, before you is an attempt by, by staff to sort of give you some reference on where, where we are in terms of our request compared to peers across the state of California in terms of basis points, right? So I caution you a couple of things. Um, when you look at this, which is a specifically uh, a comparison of our personal expense compared to other uh, jurisdictions across the state of California based on asset sites, I caution you of two things. Number one, uh, I would think that um, um, personal expenses in the Bay Area is just going to be larger than in, in most areas across the state of California, number one. And number two, um, you see right here that while federated is 12 basis points, police and fire is nine, and the combined is 10 basis points. I think it will make more sense for you to look at the combined number, because I think in this particular case, federated is impacted by the fact that you have a lower asset base, even though for personal purposes, what we do is we split the cost in half between the two, meaning between the two plans, except as I indicated for investments, which is a 60-40 uh, split. But for example, if you use the asset size for both plans, that's about $6.3 billion, which put up uh, right just above the nine basis points compared to other public pension plans. So I think we are right there. You can see, if you look at the graph on the bottom, the, uh, the plus sign uh, indicates uh, where we stand compared to, to our peers. Again, this is two things. This is to just kind of give you a, a basic reference uh, of where we are in comparison to our peers and hopefully to show you that what we are requesting is not unreasonable. I also want to remind you this is based on CAFE information. And even though we try to make these apples to apples, it may not be always the case. For example, you recall that I mentioned the $435,000 that we included in this budget on investment related expenses. Some of our peers do not include any investment related expense. In that respect, we will look a little more expensive. So, uh, all everything else equal, if we have these uh, numbers without including the 435,000, we may be closer to the nine basis points. If we can go to the next uh, slide, it's the same information, but in terms of basis points, uh, dollars. Uh, again, the combined here is 6.3 million. And if you look below the average for the pension plans and assets between five and 10 billion is 6.7. So in this particular case, we look uh, right in line with our peers uh, across the state, maybe just a bit lower. Um, if we can go to the next slide. This one, uh, same concept, but instead of just looking at personnel, we're looking at the whole administrative cost, right? So again, Federated looks higher than police and fire because it's a lower asset base. And again, we split all costs 50-50, except for on personnel, the 60-40 uh, for investments. Uh, so again, I caution you to, instead of looking at federated alone, you should look at the combined number for the San Jose plan, so 17 basis points. And in this particular case, 
we do look a little higher than our peers. Uh, so below the combined plans is a $10.46 million. Uh, and on asset sides, uh, the plans between five and 10 billion are 13 basis points. So we, we do look uh, more expensive, but again, another caution there is uh, to make sure that we have apples to apples. Uh, like I said, we have kept the $435,000 uh, expense uh, investment related and and we also include all of our investment uh, personnel costs and you know I think uh, across the state some plans do include investment personnel costs but others um, don't include any and so uh, that also may be a reason for the disparity in the business plans but nevertheless I think that we you know when you compare us across the state is still a reasonable in terms of basis points. And I think that concludes the presentation. Is there any, are there any other slides after that, uh, Barbara? Same slide in terms of dollars, right? So here, when you look at the, the dollar figure, we are a lot closer to our peers, uh, about 10.5 million compared to $10 million for plans uh, between five and 10 billion in assets. And uh, again, the last four slides are just to give you more a point of reference in terms of the total administrative budget request. Uh, I'm happy to address any issues or answer any questions uh, on, on the request. Okay, I have one more. Sure. Um, so if you were to take the 435 out of your non-personal that you've been talking about and put it in the overall cost of investment the plans yes um that would then be picked up within the, the overall i guess you know, uh, plan yes um, but what i hear you saying is that's what these other california public pension plans do is that correct yeah, most of them. I, I really can't speak for all of them. I think that each one have their own way of doing things. But but for the most part, from a definition standpoint, from the California code, investment related expenses are not viewed or they're not really part of administrative budget. And so it's hard to say to what extent other systems uh, keep some of that cost or not, I can tell you uh, in my other two jobs in the state of California, uh, I always kept the, uh, if we had any investment related personnel expense, I always kept it as part of the budget, but anything else uh, was excluded. Anything else was excluded. So for example, you, you did not see here the cost associated with the investment consultants, right? Because that's investment expenses. That's not part of the administrative budget. Okay, so if they were to come to you with cost recut, cutting, well, it's not really a cost cut, but you know, as Jay knows, <laughs> please yes. do this. Um, moving things to different areas also is a reduction to the general fund and budget reductions right now are reductions to the general fund. That's what they're looking at. Yes, and I, I will add that the budget funds for the plan uh, they come from the plans. I mean, I recognize that ultimately the cost is passed on to the plan sponsor in terms of the contributions, but none of these comes from the general fund. The non-personal and the staffing doesn't come from the... No, the, the, those costs are coming directly from the actual plans. So we do not have any expenses in the general fund. I see. So Office of Retirement Services is paid through the plan. That's right. And the city only pays their share of the retirement, and that's what costs them. That's why you yes. get a reduction target. All right. Well, I mean, I don't know yet. I if we do get something, uh, I will bring. I, I will share that with the staff, and and then we'll see what we can do, and then reach out to the to the boards. But you may be right. That may be the case. Uh, okay. In the past, we have received it, so I, I don't know. We'll see. Hmm. Other and, questions uh, over Virgin on the administrative budget? I have a follow-up comment. This is Trustee Sun. I yes. want to caution 
the uh, the administration st staff and the board member of removing any kind of investment related expenditure out of the administrative budget. We have already moved some. I think the budget, we the retirement service does not get any appropriation from the city. So for budget basis, basically your expenses are charged against the pension plan. I think the administrative budget gives a pe good picture to how much it costs uh, how much does the plan administration actually costs? Um, it's not for show to the public. It's also to it's also a document to to share with all the plan members. So members will know how much is actually cost us to have this uh, pension plan um, going. And if you continue as moving stuff out of the administrative budget, it created a, a, a incomplete picture. For instance, you're showing your budget comparing with the last year dropped by 1.7%. But if I add the 131% back from state street, your budget actually increased by 5.5%. It's a big, it's a different picture. Uh, I think as a member, we shouldn't know what's a true cost, what's a true administrative cost. It's not just how the definition is made. It's a true cost. As a matter of fact, I feel we need to, even though I do agree, the management fees and the management, management intent, incentive and management costs should be netted against the portfolio because that's usually we get a net rate of return for that. But for investment consultant fees to be taken out of that, that's a little bit extreme. I think as a, I am a plan member, I would like to see how that portion come, comes to become a, you know, part of the operational expenses. Um, fair point, Trustee Sun. I don't disagree with your statements. I merely wanted to make a point that since we are finalizing the presentation with comparison to other plans across the state, uh, just to keep everyone apprised that uh, you know keeping apples to apples is a challenging situation. Um, and I do want to also mention a couple of things. Uh, uh, you know, one of the changes that was brought forward by the city auditor recommendation is that now your board and the police and fire board and the city council, we you all get the same information. So everyone is getting the same data, the same sources, so uses of funds, the same memo, the same presentation. Of course, when I do go before the city council, uh, it's a much abbreviated presentation for the budget. But your point is well taken. But I also want to share with you, uh, uh, in as much as what you mentioned is true, that on the other hand, I believe that we as an office, and big kudos to Prabhu and his staff, we do more than our peers across the state in providing clear picture of what the cause of running our office, specifically as it relates to investment expenses, is. And so, you know, I think uh, Trustee uh, CIO Palani mentioned this earlier today, but sometimes we don't get enough kudos for that. But we do, uh, in September, goes before the uh, city council to provide actual exp investment related expenses, which, by the way, it includes information on the investment consultants uh, for the calendar year. And I think that you will find that that information and report that first is provided to the boards in April and then presented to the city council in September is robust and it's a lot more detailed and comprehensive than many of our peers uh, across this day. And I even including culprits and costers on that. So I don't disagree with you. Trust me, uh, I'm a big believer on transparency. And I think it's important that we are consistent and that we provide the information as much as possible. So I'm not disagreeing with your statements. I'm just uh, wanting to make sure that it's understood that, that we take that seriously and that we want to be at transparency we can in every case. And I will say something too. Um, I do budget. You know, my background is budget. My experience is budget for like the last 30 years. And I've been 17 years in the city of San Jose doing budget. And I am in a very large department that is like the third largest general fund. So I've been there when we've had budget reductions. 
events and going forward with presentation. And I just want to um, say that I think your presentation was thorough, was good. Um, I think, uh, yes, you had a, really, it's a comparison between the adopted 1920 to the proposed and you show a drop in non-personal. However, you explain it in the further slides. And yes, things move around. I mean, that's what happens. One time monies go away, transfers happen. And I think you were thorough about that. So um, given my budget background, uh, I think the presentation is thorough in going through the various uh, aspects of it. Uh, and I think that's transparent. So just my two bits. Other questions, comments, uh, Trustee Orr? Oh, sorry. That was it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, Can I have something else to say? I have a, a couple of issue with this budget. I mean, I, I do. I want to follow up with uh, just uh, with um, you know CEO's statement. I think the staff has been great. The the reports they produce producing the fall regarding the costs, investment costs, and then investment fees and consulting fees are very thorough. True, we do have the information, but um, my point on some some of the information, yes, when we get all those information, but those information are not released at the same time. And then please, re please remember, we only meet in this board once every month. Uh, we're not in this investment operation day in and day out. And some of the things we do not recollect very well. When you don't put the information in one page, um, it kind of uh, lost in in a time um, that doesn't say anything uh, less about the staff i think you have a fabulous investment staff they have done great work however on the other side i i notice that you are adding one investment staff to the new budget i am not supportive of that um, i think you should just think about not adding that staff at this time my point is that we are even though there are so many vague and gray area in comparison with our plan with other plans, we're with the based on the information given, um, we're still showing us as more expensive than other plans. Um, you probably need to do more research to see if that position is justified. It's a senior investment staff position. It's probably one of the more important, more expensive position in the retirement service administration. Um, so I'm not supportive on that. I'm not saying anything against the staff. I think staff has been great. Um, but I'm just thinking may not be very justifiable at this time, especially when the city is going to looking to have some steep cut for the entire city budget. Even though the retirement service does not require, re receive any city budget allocation appropriation from the city or from the general fund, you are charged against the retirement plan. We are probably looking at a very different, very difficult year next year. So it's kind of hard for me to say, yes, let's add another senior investment staff position to the plan minister. Why I don't know if that position is going to provide a positive result for the pension. Second of all, my point on um, the, the cost split between police and fire and then federated. I brought out this issue last year. I really want to urge the staff to think about split the cost based on asset side instead of 50 50. I mean, there is a quite a bit difference between federated and police fire. If you look at one of the comparisons, right, uh, on basis points, uh, federated was like 20 basis points on the cost. Okay, administrative cost expense on the on the slide 17. 20, 20 basis points for federated police and fire is a 15 basis points. I think something has that has something to do with the splitting of the cost. Yeah, so you are splitting investment expenses by 60, 40, but everything else is split 50, 50. And then I may want to point out to you the police and fire department is only going to Police and fire only have a request to cut their budget by 0.5% by for the next year. But 
but every other department is cutting a lot. The finance department is asking is asked to cut the budget by 18 percent. I can tell you next year the comp contribution from the federated plan will be a lot lower, and then the 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 difference the difference in asset size between federated plan and the police and fire plan will be greater. Yet, if we are still continue to carry fifty percent of the fifty percent of the sum of the fixed costs, the 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 differential will be even wider. Is that fair to the federated members? So that's why I want to urge the staff to consider changing the methodology. Maybe not for this year, but think about the future. Um, Roberto or um, Problem, could you say something about the service level impact of the uh, new position? Um, not not just this uh, additional investment staff person, but you know, I, I'm. I'm going to guess that you can describe uh, what we think will get better or faster or of higher quality um, as a result of adding the position. Yeah, I, I, I'll I'll give some color and then I'll have uh, uh, Roberto uh, so much more eloquent about these things. <laughs> I'm going to have him add uh, to that. Uh, so. Uh, the reason to have a senior investment officer, and uh, so let me make this very clear. Uh, part of the reason is uh, the way the, the city process works in terms of adding positions. And we feel internally, we have uh, two senior positions. Uh, one is the head of private markets and the other is the head of public markets. And the head of private markets is a senior investment officer. The head of public markets, which is just as important a position, is an investment officer position. And if we are to reclassify the head of public markets as a senior investment officer, uh, we simply cannot promote someone and change the title. And I'm sure Robert will have some things to add to this, but the way to do it would be to actually request for a position uh, a senior investment officer position. And if we are promoting from within to reclassify uh, the IO as a senior IO, and we also have similarly an investment analyst position where clearly the work that is being done is extremely important and of such high caliber that I think it should be an investment officer position. So the, the request is really to reclassify a couple of our personnel and I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to tell them before, but the question was posed to me in a public meeting, so I'm forced to say this. But so the idea is really to promote from within and really create one investment analyst position. And to create the investment analyst position, what we have to do and to promote the other two gentlemen uh, is to reclassify those positions. And so the net effect of it comes out to be as if we are adding a new senior investment officer position. Now, the reason to add an investment analyst position, and I can tell you, we are constantly looking for ways to cut costs. And we are very, very mindful. As Roberto mentioned, this uh, budget came about prior to the meltdown and we gave it a lot of thought. We spoke to uh, Nick Almeida in the mayor's office and anything that we do, even though we are under measure G, and especially when it comes to investment staff, we have to justify everything that we do. A lot of thought and analysis goes into making any requests. These are not arbitrary requests. So in the present instance, we figured a way of cutting, and this is probably not obvious here, about $350,000 from one of our consultants. And we decided to do that work in-house and the cost of an investment analyst is probably about 75 to 100 grand. And so that's how we justified the position. <clears throat> so we, we, we think very close carefully before trying to add costs. And we only, do, we only add positions if there is a net reduction in costs. And in fact, at a much higher level, 
uh, and this is something that I will <clears throat> talk to the ICs and the boards in future. And this is also a conversation that I've had with the mayor and his staff. You know, if, if you look at our investment fees, you know, it's 60 or 65 million, it seems like a high number. If you look at some of the more successful and well-run public plans on the investment side, a lot of the work that they do is done in-house. And so what they've essentially done is substituted expensive manager and consultant work sometimes and brought that in-house and made it cheaper. And so we are taking baby steps towards that. We are not there yet. And so in the present instance, uh, we, we achieved a saving of over 350 grand or so by cutting out that particular services, those services. And we the hope was to transfer it to a cheaper uh, in-house investment analyst. Uh, with that, I will let Roberto talk and add what he wants to say. Um, can I add one piece here just as suggestion? Yeah. yeah. I use these all the time. Um, I heard something that I did not hear during the presentation, and that was that the ads that you were doing, the ad deletes that you were doing also included non-personal reduction, and that overall the cost was lower, I assume ongoing. Um, and that changes the presentation of sorts of what you're doing, and also if that's the case, <laughs> provides a well thought out plan. Uh, maybe just putting that in there, um, you know, updating it to make it clear that the ad deletes you're doing is either net zero or a lower of cost overall. And, you know, we do this. That's what we do in the city. This is how the city budget works. You know, you look, you reorganize, you take into account uh, what is appropriate staffing and you a lot of times make it net zero. I just think that would be clearer and then probably the discussion might not have transpired. Berto, do you want to add anything? Um, well, two things. Well, first, uh, to Trustee Jenny's point uh, very well, uh, duly noted, um, as Prabhu indicated, we do work behind the scenes um, and, you know, I do have a line of communication with my contact person at the mayor's office. And when I come before your board to present, we already have made, uh, provided information necessary for the, our uh, request to be supported. Uh, so shame on, on me, I guess, but not being a little more specific, uh, you know, on the presentation. Uh, in terms of Prabhu's statements, he is extremely eloquent. I have nothing else to add. Uh, I think he said everything needed to be said and uh, well said, I might add. And um, yeah, I mean, it is important to understand, obviously, a lot of departments, as trustees son indicated, uh, you know, and some of them will share more on the pain than others. Uh, that, that's unfortunately the truth. Uh, but um, I just wanted to echo, um, uh, you know, trust, uh, Trustee Palani, he was a trustee at some point. CIO <laughs> Palani comments that um, we don't take the things lightly. We think through everything that we are trying to accomplish. And, and I don't want anyone to think that, you know, we are there to think that we want to just spend money. We, our goal is to become as efficient and effective as we can. And whatever funds that we have to spend, we want to make sure that it's well thought out. So to the uh, extent possible, uh, we always try to limit the costs associated with doing business. And so we will continue doing so. Uh, we just have to make sure that uh, I, I explain or express that situation better in the future. So thank you for the input. I wanna okay. offer a couple of rebuttal too. Um, I don't wanna keep this debate going on and on, but I just wanna provide a couple of rebuttal to what uh, CIO statement. One is an investment analysis only costs about 75,000 to 100,000. I don't think that's a true statement. You need to take a look at a benefit plus salary. I think an investment analyst could cost, us, cost the city close to $200,000 between salary and benefit. Second, there's a, he, he also stated that um, a, a more successful plan um, in the nation has some evidence 
uh, showing that they are taking some more services in house. I'm not so sure I share with that. I I I, I, I'm sure I, I, I share that view, but I am, I don't have any evidence to re rebuke that. So if this if the CIO can provide some evidence on that um, or some research in that area, that'd be great to the board. I would much I would very much you know interested in reading anything like that. Be, uh, one thing from the reason for my saying stay, stating that because I choose the past seminars and the trainings, I remember one of the most successful pension fund in this country is a majority of lay ma passively managed index and pension fund that built with most index fund. I think if if it's in the, if it's not in Nevada, it's in Nebraska. Some some state starts with N. I I believe reading in a statement in Trustee Harvest's uh, uh, travel. Uh, Training plan. He also mentioned that it's a passive managed fund portfolio should be fairly cheap. So uh, regarding your staffing, you do have a lot of uh, the staff has to provide a lot of work. It is it, even though you have some cost cutting some other area. Um, I feel that our investment team with a ten staff member right now for the portfolio side, we are on the high side. I, if you really want to add more staffing, can, can I ask um, you, uh, the administrative staff to look, do some research, especially in the Bay Area. There are several plans in San Francisco, Alameda, San Mateo. You look at their FTE, investment FTE per comparison with and, and versus their plan size to see what's the average FTE to their plan size, and maybe we can justify the, in the position. Well, if I can add something, uh, Chair Castellano, uh, to what Trustee Sun said, there's this overwhelming evidence that the best run plans have uh, a very high quality in-house investment team. And I would cite the Canadian plans as the gold standard. Uh, in the US, the state of Wisconsin to me is the gold standard. And uh, now not all of their investment management services are in in-house. They certainly use outside managers, uh, not just passively. Uh, a lot of plans, including CalPERS and CalSTRS have their own in-house teams managing passive assets and some active assets and as does Wisconsin. Uh, so I'm certainly happy to share that with the ICs and the boards on an ongoing basis. That requires a very different mindset and a very different compensation level, uh, much higher than what uh, investment team currently gets because it's a different skill set. And that's a very long term uh, project for us. And I'm certainly happy to engage with the boards in ongoing discussion. Uh, so, on the investment analyst, I, I think Trustee Sun made some uh, remark about 200,000. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm sure there are investment analysts and investment analysts. And, we, and the finance department might pay differently, uh, but we were really looking to get a junior investment analyst and, and she, sure there's compensation, but the base for that position is 75,000. Uh, yeah, Prabhu, you're correct. I mean, the tr both of you were correct, Trustee Son and you, you, you were referring to the salary, but, uh, but, but you are correct as well. Uh, the big portion of the benefits cause to the investment analysts in, in finance, I suspect the biggest cause is the one related to the retirement benefit, which as you know, our positions are not part of our uh, defined benefit plan. So that cost is not there, it's only whatever cost is associated with the tier three, which is, I can tell you from experience, is about $5,000 a year. <laughs> so that may be the biggest piece difference between the cost for an investment analyst today for us in our office versus an investment analyst at the finance office. Oh, Roberto, I had a follow-up question regarding sure. the allocation of the cost of the investment staff to 60-40. I'm gonna guess that at some point that was based on assets between the two plans. And, um, but right now, it seems like we're getting a deal because um, our assets are not, the uh, police and fire assets aren't one and a half times hours at this point. So is, is that something, how does that get revisited? 
we could, you know, not, not that I'm we, advocating because we're getting, you know, I, I can tell the police and fire board that Frederick decided that they didn't want such a good deal. No, uh, point well taken. It, it's not revisited. I mean, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Um, certainly, and of course, we want to be as, as, as clear and as appropriate with the cost allocation as possible. Having said that, I think there is a, a cost effective uh, uh, ratio here that we have to be mindful that the total cost for the office is going to be what it's going to be. I can understand that the boards, particularly each board, is going to want to look at the own cost, but um, we just want to find a way to assign some cost that is somewhat reasonable. And you know the 60-40, you're correct. That was the approach a few years back. Um, it have moved back and forth. Sometimes police and fire gets a better deal. Sometimes you, uh, uh, you know, the plan gets a better deal, a better deal uh, federated. So uh, we we don't revisit that every year. I think for purposes of a budget, I think uh, I think using the 60-40 split is reasonable. Uh, let's not forget that on the other side of that equation. The rest of the costs associated with the with the budget is 50-50, and who knows, uh, you know, how is that share, right? Uh, of course, there are more members on the federated side, but we know we get more questions from the police and fire side. So, you know, I suspect that if we were going to spend six months trying to keep track of how much time staff split between Fed and police and fire, that sure, it may not be exactly 50-50, but I don't think it's going to be such an alarming difference that it's gonna have a huge uh, impact on the budget. And let's face it, when I go to the city council, they're looking at the total request for the office. They don't look at it between police and fire and federated. So I guess my point here is, I hear what you're saying, but I think for purposes of allocation, it's a reasonable approach to take. And at the end of the day, we are actually going to the city council and asking for a total budget for the office, which is a combination of both. Okay. Now, again, I'm not advocating for it um, or, or, or the, the steps to do something like that, all the cost behind it might go with it. But where is that embedded, the 6040? Well, it, it, it was based on uh, asset sites a few years back, and it's just related to the uh, personnel cost for investment staff, just personnel cost for investment staff. That's where uh, it is. Yeah, I, yeah my, my question is about the, 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 the actual number, 6040. Is that in the code? Is that by policy? No, no, that was just, uh, that was just uh, we decided to, you, everything used to be 50-50, and a few years back, Federated was complaining, and we agreed to a 60-40 split. Okay. Uh, okay, very good. Question? Yes, uh, Trustee Horowitz. Um, just a quick comment um, uh, on, on Trustee Sun. It's, uh, in fact, uh, the state of Nevada, not Nebraska, that has the passive approach, and I believe they have exactly one employee on the investment side. Uh, as far as uh, allocating the personnel costs, it seems to me the time spent um, uh, by the non-investment side of the uh, office is probably related to the number, either the number of employees or the number of retirees uh, that are in the population. So uh, I'm wondering, uh, police and fire versus federated, what that split would be. Is that closer to 50-50 or... Uh, or is there a very different, great difference in the number of personnel? The, the, the cost, we split it 50-50, but there are a lot more active and retired federal members than there are active and retired police and fire members. So on that basis, it does seem like federated is getting a bit of a deal. Out of well, yes, but by the same token, as I mentioned before, you're correct. There are some areas that, that that's the case, but in other ones, we do, in many cases, get more questions, so deal with more issues from the police and fire membership than the federated. So it, it's hard to say. I mean, but, but if you look at it strictly from the ratio of membership, 
between Fed and police and fire. If you look at it just from that standpoint, you are correct, uh, Trustee Horowitz. Then in that in that sense, the Federated will be getting the, the deal. Isn't it something like four thousand police and fire retirees and oh, I'm sorry, four thousand federated retirees and twenty five hundred police and fire or something like that? Um, and you, you think I should know that by heart now because I look at those numbers on Tuesday in my presentation to the city council, but I don't remember. I think it's okay. a little different, yes, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that, it that. is higher. All right, so we have uh, we have the proposed uh, 2021 budget in front of you. Uh, uh, memo from uh, Benji Foy and the presentation from uh, Mr. Pena. We have a motion and a second. Uh, on this item, I motion to accept it. So you motion to approve the uh, the proposed budget for fiscal twenty twenty one. Yes. As as presented. As as presented, uh, Trustee Jennings, you're on mute. You're still on mute. And then muted. You're on mute. <laughs> so my, my clarification question was as presented? Yes. OK. Presented. You have a motion from Trustee Jennings? Seconded. Second by Trustee Horowitz. Further discussion by the board? Is there any public discussion? Let's proceed to a roll call vote. Uh, Vice Chair Chandra? Yeah, I, I vote aye, and unfortunately, I'll have to drop off here in the next few minutes for uh, a work meeting. Okay, thank you for letting us know. Trustee Horowitz? Aye. Trustee Jennings? Aye. Trustee Kelleher? Aye. Trustee Orr? Aye. Trustee Sun? I do not accept this budget. I already brought my objection. Sorry. Okay, uh, I also vote aye. That motion carries on a six to one vote uh, with uh, Trustee Sun dissenting. Thank you very much, everybody, for that action. Uh, item 4D discussion and action on extending the term date of the agreement between the boards of administration and LRWL Siegel. Uh, thank you, Chair. This is Barbara Heyman, Deputy Director for the Office of Retirement Services. Yes. Um, this memo is requesting authorization for the secretary to um, execute a fifth amendment to the Siegel, uh, formerly known as Eller Wexler, um, agreement uh, to extend the term date only to June 30th, 2020. There's no additional cost associated with uh, the request. Um, and this is going to allow for the um, pension administration project to uh, wrap up and for um, Siegel or Eller Wexler to come to the audit committee and give the final update um, to finalize the project. Okay, very good. And, and I noticed, Barbara, this one we, you know, we tried to push this on to get this onto the March agenda, which of course that meeting was canceled and uh, the uh, delay in this uh, doesn't affect the timing? Uh, no, actually, um, Eller Wexler or Siegel have um, continued offering services even though the contract is expired. Okay, and, and it doesn't need to go past June 30th, I guess that was really my question. No, no, we will have wrapped up and the next audit committee is scheduled to take place in May. Okay, very good. All right. Any questions, discussion? Could I please have a motion and a second to uh, approve the extension of the term date of the agreement between the boards and uh, Siegel? Yeah, I'll, I'm still here, so I'll make a motion to approve the extension. Thank you, Vice Chair Chandra. All second motion. Second by Trustee Kelleher. Yes. Any other discussion? Any public discussion? A roll call vote, uh, Vice Chair Chandra? Aye. Trustee Horowitz? Aye. Trustee Jennings? Aye. 
Trustee Kelleher? Aye. Trustee Orr? Aye. Trustee Sun? Aye. And I also vote aye. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Moving forward to item 4E, discussion and action on fiduciary insurance and waiver recourse fees for policy year March 2021. This is um, this item is regarding your fiduciary insurance. Uh, your fiduciary insurance expired at the end of March. While we initiated the process at the beginning of the year, like we always do, due to our broker contact changing at the end of February and then the COVID-19 and all the challenges with it, we did not hear back from the insurance broker on time. So this did not allow us to bring this to the board until today. Um, the increase in insurance premium is about 21,000, an 11 and percent increase, which is greater than the amount that the board has approved the CEO to have authority over, which is 5%. This is the first time in several years where the increase has been more than 5% and brought to the board for approval. The police and fire plan also had an increase in their premium of about 8.7%. The federated increase is slightly higher due to more plan members, which increases the potential for litigation as well as a lower funding ratio. So while we are asking for your approval for the premium, um, and while the premium has increased, this will still be within the budget for the non-personnel services. Do you have any questions? Any questions on the memo? And. Um, Benji, there is an action item in here for individual trustees to remit their uh, their own seventy five dollars. So will that um, will we get a prompt of some sort from staff? Um, yes, um, we right now because of the situation, um, we don't really want the trustees to be sending their checks into the office since there's real there's not a lot of us there. Um, so we we're going to wait a little bit and then. Um, Linda will probably send out an email just reminding everyone what to do with it. At that time, maybe you can hand it to one of the staff if we can meet in person. Okay. So for this one, we need an uh, action. Uh, we have a motion and second to um, approve the fiduciary insurance waiver recourse fees for policy year uh, March, 2021. Uh, Trustee Chandra, so moved. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Chandra. I'll second the motion, Mr. Trustee uh, Kelleher. Trustee Kelleher uh, seconds that motion. Any other discussion? Any public discussion? And we'll call vote Vice Chair Chandra. Aye. Trustee Horowitz. Aye. Trustee Jennings. Aye. Trustee Kelleher. Aye. Trustee Orr. Aye. Trustee Sun. I also vote aye. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you again. Item 4E, discussion and action on authorizing the secretary to negotiate and execute the tenant lease agreement among Pacific Resources First American LLC and the Board of Administration for the Police and Fire Department uh, Retirement Plan and the Board of Administration for the Federated City Employees Retirement System for a five-year term ending March 31, 2025. Total cost to be split 50 50 with a police and fire plan. Um, just a, as, as a matter of note, uh, in the third line of that agenda item, is that correct? Police and fire department retirement plan? That is correct. Okay. Uh, so, Barbara Heyman, Deputy Director, Office of Retirement Services. Um, this memo is um, requesting authorization for the secretary um, to um, negotiate and execute the tenant lease. Um, Dinesh uh, from the investments group has done uh, a tremendous amount of work in putting this together. Um, and he did uh, research on the local real estate market um, and the availability of uh, comparable properties in the area. Um, so site tours were conducted for several of the properties. Lease proposals were received and a comprehensive comparison completed. Uh, and after a complete and um, thorough market analysis um, of the available alternate options, uh, it is um, 
the current building does still offer um, a very cost effective option and, and does provide some good value. So we are recommending um, extending the, the lease for the current building. Very good. <clears throat> Any uh, questions on this item? Sure, this is Trustee Kelleher. Um, given the, the COVID uh, pandemic, has it market changed? Have you uh, considered that? The market uh, definitely has changed, uh, but our lease did run out on March um, 31st, 2020. Oh. <laughs> yes, it was, it, it's truly most unfortunate. But there may be opportunity in the future to, to perhaps renegotiate. Yeah, I, I would think that you would want to start renegotiating now versus uh, because certainly the landlord is not going to want to lose a tenant, especially a, a tenant as credit worthy as, mm -hmm. as you. Yes, understood. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, can I have a motion and second to authorize the secretary to negotiate and execute the uh, agreement as described. I recommend to uh, uh, okay, the motion. Jennings. Motion is made by Trustee Jennings. Can I have a second? Sure, Trustee Kelleher will second the motion. Thank you very much, Trustee Kelleher. Any other board discussion, public discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I just yes. wanted to echo some of the words by Barbara Heyman on uh, publicly giving a shout out and thank you to Dinash. Um, he did an excellent work. He took quite a few hours on his own to um, just see what the market bear and look at possible options, which we ended up visiting as Barbara indicated. So it was a remarkable, a remarkable work by Dinesh and I just wanted to publicly uh, thank Dinesh for his work and, uh, and his input uh, throughout the process. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you and thank you. Okay, so we have a motion second. Any, any other board discussion? Any public discussion? Uh, we'll call vote. I'm sorry, did um, I cut someone off? Uh, yeah, Trustee Harwood, just following up on what uh, Trustee Keller has said, is it possible to, I know it's late in the game and a lot of work has already gone into it, uh, uh, to shorten the term of the lease or uh, to somehow put us in a better position to take advantage of what may be a much more soft uh, real estate market here in the next 12 months? Uh, or can we obtain an option to lease for, for a shorter term than the five-year term? It would seem to me that there's a real opportunity for cost savings here if we could, you know, unfortunately we are kind of jammed up at exactly the wrong time of uh, ex an expiring lease at March 31st, but. Yeah, so, um... We'll certainly reach out back to the landlord and see what options are available. I think your point, both of your points are worth taking and, you know, um, I'm not sure if we have any um, flexibility at this point, but we'll, we'll check and, and, and we'll let the board know uh, what we find out. Are you listening, uh, Dinesh? Are you there? Yes, I'm on the line and uh, just yeah. add some comparison. When we did go through the process, we found that the airport submarket, which is where our current building falls within, the average asking rent rate is actually $3.40 per square foot compared to the $2.85 that we were able to negotiate. And since we negotiated that particular price, uh, Google has actually been quite active in leasing and both purchasing buildings along the North First Street corridor. So the market's actually tightened up before the virus, although obviously the, the virus has changed things since then. We did bring up the topic of lease term with the landlord 
And the landlord is also trying to manage the overall building lease rollover schedule. And for us, that means that they would only agree to a five-year lease, nothing shorter, nothing longer. Okay, thank you for that uh, information. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Vinay. All right, uh, roll call vote. Uh, Vice Chair Jandra. I think he had to leave. Uh, Trustee Horwitz. Uh, affirmative. Trustee Jennings. I uh, approve. Trustee Kelleher. Aye. Trustee Orr. Aye. Trustee Sun. Trustee Sun? Aye. Okay, thank you very much. I, I also vote aye. That motion carries unanimously 6 0, uh, with the uh, Vice Chair Chandra having left the meeting. Okay. Uh, going on then now to item five committees, reports, recommendations. Five one is the investment committee. Five uh, A, um, oral update for the chair of the investment committee, who would be Vice Chair Chandra. Is there a report in lieu of uh, Vice Chair Chandra? This is Trustee Orr. I don't think there's any specific report given that we had the special investment committee and then followed up by the special board meeting. Okay, thank you very much. 5B or minutes from January 28th, that's receiving file. 5-2 is governance committee. Uh, and here we've got the next meeting on June 18th. Uh, 5A, oral update from the chair of the governance committee. Uh, yes, we met and uh, approved some minor changes in, in several documents uh, just to enhance conformity between the Fed and police and fire. Uh, maybe the one document that was of more interest in debate was the Office of Retirement Services budget policies and procedures. And apropos the discussion we just had with um, uh, Chairman, uh, uh, CEO Pena's discussion, we acknowledge that uh, we report, that is the, the board reports, the uh, investment management fees as a net out of the uh, gross management returns and the city expects to see those as a cost of administration so there's there's this uh, a disagreement on the budgeting um, interpretation of those particular fees and we acknowledge that in the new budget documents okay very good thank you uh, 5b minutes of the december 5th uh, Joint Governance Committee that's a uh, receiving file. 5 3 Audit Committee. The uh, last meeting was February 20th, next meeting May 20th. 5A is the oral update from the chair of the Audit Committee. Trustee Kelleher, do you have an update for us? Sure. Uh, in terms of old business, um, we uh, got an update on the Pension Administration System implementation project, and that is continuing to be on track. Um, in terms of new business, uh, we had a discussion and action on the approval of federated retirement systems, uh, comprehensive annual financial reports. Uh, so they are in draft form and uh, there are no new accounting standards. And so uh, that's on track. And then um, We also reviewed the audit uh, and no significant issues were found. Um, we had a discussion on investment wires and internal transfers. Uh, we had a number of issues that were identified and uh, we addressed to further strengthen controls over the investment cash outflow process. And then we had a discussion on the death and verification and overpayment tracking process. Um, Again, uh, there were some issues that were found and uh, recommendations have been made to uh, improve the implementation of the death and verification. And that is all. Okay, very good. Thank you very much for that. Uh, five, um, uh, item B of minutes uh, from the October 17th Joint Audit Committee that's received in file. Uh, the travel, 
a quarterly travel attendance analysis, uh, receive and file, update on PAS's uh, receive and file, report on the debt benefits distribution process uh, by the internal auditors, receive and file, and cash on, report on the cash disbursement process by the internal auditor, also receive and file. 5.4 is a joint personnel committee. Our last meeting was on January 25th. Next meeting is TBD. Um, I do not have anything on an oral update today. Uh, 5B minutes from the October 28th joint meeting is receive and file. Item six, education and training. We have a number of things listed there. A few understandably canceled. Um, are there future agenda items? Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Council. Thank you, Harvey Lederman, Reed Smith. Um, wanted to bring the board up to date on uh, something of statewide, in fact, nationwide interest and um, uh, put it on, a, on next month's agenda just from a timing standpoint. This has to do with the, uh, what, what has come to be known as the vested rights litigation. Um, uh, active members sure, certainly will remember after the last great recession, uh, about eight years ago, uh, the state of California, state legislature, and many cities, including San Jose, passed what they consider to be reform uh, legislation that had uh, significant effects on the pension calculations and benefits and formulas for not only new employees, but also for legacy active employees uh, of the systems. But uh, that legislation in 2012, and in San Jose, it was what was called Measure B at the time. Uh, but in the state, it was kind of labeled under PEPRA, um, pension reform. It led to uh, litigation up and down the state over the issue of vested rights. That is, if a member had started employment under a certain formula or certain things being counted, uh, towards their pensionable compensation, what right did the state or the city uh, or counties have to change the formulas mid-career? Uh, and it became known as the vested rights litigation. Uh, we've been actively involved. Um, as you know, San Jose ultimately settled its litigation through a series of other measures, including I think the last one was called Measure F. Uh, as in Frank, um, statewide, um, these cases work their way up uh, through trial courts and courts of appeals and have been pending in the California Supreme Court, which granted review well over almost two years ago, uh, and they have not been heard. A related case was heard um, last year called Cal Fire of California firefighters, but they did not rule on the vested rights issue in CAL FIRE. Um, this is a long way of saying that last night we received, uh, we, we happened to be counsel on counsel to two of the county retirement systems that are in the case that's uh, prominent in the Supreme Court. And we've been waiting for over a year and a half to be scheduled for oral argument. Last night, the court sent us a notice that we will have oral argument in the vested rights cases on Tuesday, May 5th at nine o'clock. It's going to be like this meeting. Uh, it's being done by virtual um, video and, and telephonic uh, argument, which is going to be something new. Uh, but I wanted to let the board know because um, uh, I'll be able to make a report on that argument and the likely outcome at the next uh, federated board meeting for the, the May, the month of May. Uh, again, and if anybody wants to tune in, it's open to the public to hear the argument. Again, it's May 5th, Tuesday, May 5th at nine o'clock on the court's uh, morning calendar. Uh, so just wanted to let everybody know that um, this is the first of literally seven cases uh, dealing with vested rights of members and their constitutional uh, basis for not impacting their, their benefits. Uh, 
seven cases are stacked up in the Supreme Court right now waiting oral argument. This is the first one that will directly address the vested rights uh, issue uh, statewide and is being watched nationally as well. Um, so that's, that's the current update. Thank you for letting me bring that to your attention. Happy to answer any questions and we'll have more to talk about uh, at the May meeting. This is Trustee Jennings. Um, yes. If you could send me um, the information, you know, if they're doing a Zoom or the, you know, you said it's a public meeting so other people can listen. Is there some sort of, you know, we need the ID. Right? Yeah, there, there will be, there will be, I'll, I'll shoot that to you if you wish. There, there will be uh, public access uh, to listen to the argument uh, telephonically. I'd appreciate that, thank you. Absolutely. And, and does our plan have a great exposure to the, uh, whatever the outcome is? No, um, because San, the city of San Jose, uh, most uh, city of San Jose is a charter city and the PEPRA legislation did not affect charter cities. It only affected mm -hmm. members of CalPERS, CalSTRS, uh, UC Regents and the county systems and, and other cities that are not charter cities. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in San Jose, that uh, that litigation was fully settled. So the the um, exposure, if you will, is that if the court sets a new standard by which uh, benefits are determined to be locked in or not locked in, that could affect, especially in the current economic situation, that could affect um, political and labor decisions that uh, may go forward in the future. Okay, yeah, good, thank you. Trustee Jennings, you're on mute. Trustee Jennings, you're on mute. Trustee Jennings, I, I think you're speaking, but okay. you're on mute. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I'm getting tired. <laughs> Um, I remember you bringing this up before, like when I first started attending these meetings. And I thought that it did have a bigger impact if on the rare chance they did make a change, that it could change um, the percentages that are set for retirees. I, I thought I heard you say something like that. It's very rare and it shouldn't happen, but I thought there was a risk there. The, um, if I may, Mr. Chairman, the, the, the San Jose plans uh, are now uh, reflective of a collectively bargained framework um, between the city and its labor unions and it's also binding on their uh, exempt employees as well. Uh, so the, any decision in the Supreme Court uh, under, under PEPRA and the accompanying law, AB uh, Assembly Bill 197 that passed in 2012 would not itself directly impact the city of San Jose or that framework uh, which is now written into the city's municipal code. Um, the impact, of course, could be as to any future uh, action by the city council or collective bargaining between the city and its bargaining units um, going forward. Uh, of course, it's just speculative as to whether or not those actions in the future might impact current active members or only future employees to be hired. So that would just be speculative. Uh, but, but the rulings in these cases will not directly impact any of the, the city of San Jose's um, retirement formulas. Okay, and um, then Roberto, um, you can help us get that on the agenda for the May meeting. Yes, yes, we'll, we'll do. I'm sure our staff is taking notes, but we'll make sure, yes. I'm sure they are too, thank you. <clears throat> any other uh, future agenda items? Are there any public or retiree comments? 
Okay, well, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. As always, Linda, Michelle, um, Marty, thank you all for coordinating and allowing us to get together. Have a great Thank you, everyone. Rest of the weekend.